At number 10, brotherly love. There were some weird things happening between the gods in Egyptian mythology, as we will come to learn through this video. To get us started on this journey through the strangest of stories, let's talk about some serious closeness between the gods Osiris and Isis. These two gods were husband and wife, but they were also brother and sister. Yeah, it's weird, but they were gods, so I guess it was fine. These two ruled Egypt until their other brother, Set, killed Osiris. When her husband died, Isis went on a search to find Osiris' body because she just really wanted to have a child with him and just wasn't gonna let pesky old death get in her way. When she found Osiris' remains, she was able to resurrect him for long enough for them to conceive a child. However, that process was a little difficult because she wasn't able to get the most important part of him for that because a fish had apparently eaten his member. Again, Isis was a very resilient woman, and quite crafty too because she just crafted him a new device, if you will, and they went on to produce a son, Horus, who would later become the new king of Egypt. This story is a little weird, don't get me wrong, but it's also a story of perseverance, I guess, so maybe it's not all bad. Hi number nine, trophies. I know a lot of people like to save little mementos and souvenirs from things that meant a lot to them in life. People save movie stubs from their first date with someone, little objects from their childhoods, and a whole collection of other things saved from different points of their lives. There was an Egyptian god who sort of did the same thing, but a little creepier. Well, actually it was a lot creepier. The god Anubis was the god of mummification, and I guess you could say that he just really liked his job. He was part of the embalming process for some big names like Osiris. See, tying it back to the previous story when the god Set killed his brother Osiris, he got pretty buddy-buddy with Anubis because he offered Osiris' organs to the god of mummification. But not for Anubis since he was known to collect pieces of the remains of people that he had embalmed. He had a thing for limbs and other remains, I guess. It was a weird collection to have, that's for sure, but for the god of mummification, it almost seems fitting. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things that Egyptian gods did in their mythology, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, maybe consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, The Last Snack For the Egyptians, a person's burial and their soul's final journey was a very big deal. We are probably all familiar with the mummification practices of the ancient Egyptians and all that, but what comes after was also pretty interesting. When someone died, it was believed that their soul would then move on to be judged. The soul would leave their body and go to the underworld, searching for the Hall of Truth. Once they found it, they would then be judged on who they were in their life, and if they passed the test, then they got to go to paradise. But if they failed, then they became a nice little snack for the goddess Amit. Emmet was known as a demon goddess and dubbed the devourer of Amenti. When the deceased was tested and their heart was weighed against a feather, if they failed that test, then Emmet would eat the person's essence and they would vanish for eternity. Obviously, you wouldn't want that to happen, so I guess this was just an incentive for Egyptians to live life as a good person. At number seven, down the Nile. Now I know that I've mentioned the story of Set and Osiris a couple times now, but their story is just so messed up and weird that I have to keep including the best parts of it. Anyways, we all know that Set overthrew his brother Osiris as the king of Egypt, and did so by killing him, but let's talk about exactly how that happened. Set was a really jealous guy, and he resented his brother for being king, so he devised a plan to trick his brother into a coffin. Set had a coffin designed exactly for Osiris' measurements, and while at a party, Set challenged Osiris to get in it, as he promised that he would give the coffin as a gift to anyone who could fit inside it. So yeah, it was rigged from the start. So Osiris gets inside, and obviously it was a perfect fit. What he didn't know though was that this was where he would remain forever because Set sealed his brother in the coffin and sent it down the Nile River. After that, Osiris' wife slash sister Isis went to go find him and blah blah blah, we already know what happens next. At number 6, Lady of Plagues. Guys, if you haven't already clued in, we're still in a panorama. A panzerati. A pandemic. It seems like it'll never end, and after learning about the Egyptian goddess Sekhmet, I think I know why we're all going through this. It's because someone pissed her off big time. Sekhmet was known as the Lady of Terror, and if you don't get a good sense as to who she was just by her name, just you wait. This goddess had the ability to spread pestilence and plague against anyone who remotely angered her. So judging by that, I think if you believe in this kind of thing, someone has some serious apologizing to do. Because of this insane power, Egyptians were brought up to know that they had to stay on Sekhmet's good side, otherwise it would be risking the health and safety of themselves and those around them. 
So, this is a PSA to whoever made Sekhmet so mad. Please, go apologize. Buy her some flowers. Make a sacrifice or two if you have to. Please just make her stop. It's literally my birthday today and all I wanna do is live out my 20s in peace. Please, just do it for me. At number five, kitty love. We all know that the Egyptians loved cats. Why? I don't know. I honestly can't see why you would worship those angry little fur devils, but hey, to each their own, I guess. The Egyptians even had their own goddess for cats called Bastet, and though you might think that she was just some crazy cat lady goddess, you would be very, very wrong. Bastet had a dark side to her and was known as the Lady of Dread or the Lady of Slaughter. Kind of fitting for a name for a cat goddess since they are also evil to their core. She was known to kill other gods like the god Apophis, whom she slaughtered by cutting off his head. Regardless of her dark past though, the Egyptians still worshipped her and many even worshipped her by bringing her offerings of mummified cats to her temple. Cats bring out the darkness in people, I'm telling you. At number 4, Boozy Blood. Sometimes we make bad decisions when we're emotional. Like those times that people punch walls when they're really mad and totally regret it afterwards. Well, even though they were deities, sometimes the Egyptian gods would do some regrettable things too. Ra the sun god had a mighty temper and was known to make some pretty rash decisions. At one point, Ra decided that he wanted everyone to just die, and so he instructed his daughter Hathor to slaughter all the humans that she could find. Hathor was totally on the same page and was like, okay, bet, and went off to kill some humans. Luckily for humanity though, Ra came to his senses and had a change of heart, but by the time he caught up to Hathor, she became so bloodthirsty that there was no stopping her. So in an attempt to trick her into stopping her killing conquest, Ra filled 7,000 jars with beer and gave it to Hathor, who then became so drunk that she just gave up on her mission and decided not to kill everyone. Now they say that alcohol can't solve all your problems, but in this case it certainly did. At number three, creation. There are so many creation stories out there created by various religions and civilizations. One of the more bizarre creation stories however belongs to the ancient Egyptians because their first god did something a little weird to create life as we know it. These ancient people believed that their very first god Atum created himself and as such he had no wife and literally no one else to potentially procreate with and so to create his children and thus create humanity he pumped the hose and released humanity if you get what I'm saying here. If not you're too young to be here. Anyways, out of his pleasurable process, he created his kids Shu and Tefnut. This legend also created the term the god's hand and was used to refer to women back in ancient Egypt, since Atum's hand played the quote unquote female role in the creation of his offspring. But yeah, I guess you could say that Atum was very pleased with what he created. At number two, giant snake. There were a lot of strange animals in Egyptian mythology, one of them being a giant snake. The Egyptian god Apep was a giant snake who had some serious snake beef with their son god Ra. They were polar opposites, Ra being the light, literally, and Apep representing darkness, chaos, and evil. One day, Apep just seemed to have had enough with Ra and all of his sunshine goodness and positive vibes and just swallowed him up. He gobbled up Ra and the sun, leaving the world in complete darkness. Luckily, the other gods were there to save the day and they had to slice Apep's belly open to free Ra and restore light to the world. This evil danger noodle lost this battle, but at least he got a taste of that spicy meatball in the sky. And finally, at number one, a hearty meal. There are two sides to every person. Some people are nice on the surface, but they have a dark core that they keep hidden from the world. And the same could sort of be said for the Egyptian god Khonsu. You see, the gods were seen as helpful, but people also feared them, for good reason. I mean, these guys could pack a punch, and Khonsu was one of those guys with a serious dark side. Khonsu was the god of the moon, and was also seen as the god of healing. Sounds super positive and all, however, he was also known to eat people's hearts. Yeah, human hearts were a choice snack of his, but he was also known to dine on the hearts of select gods as well. He definitely isn't the guy to mess with because you might become his next hearty meal. Kicking off the list at number 10, Ramses II. Ramses II, part two, you see what I'm doing here. He's considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Ramses II is still considered the ruler of rulers. It's not a bad title, not bad at all. In year 30 of his reign, Ramses II was ritually transformed into an Egyptian god. Not bad, I'm turning 30 in a few years. I hope someone turns me into a god or gets me like a bike, <laughs> one of the two, I'll take both. So it was only fair if the spoiled pharaoh erected a bunch of statues 
of himself. Yeah, big selfies. Ramses put up more selfies than any other pharaoh in history. Most famous of them, the temples of Abu Simbel. There lies a monument dedicated to the late Queen Nefertiti and the Ramesseum. We kicked off a part one with Ramses signing the first ever peace treaty, so, so for part two, we had to show some of the glamour side of him, you know? Number nine, over 100 children. Who is this guy, Nick Cannon? Ramses II is the father to over 100 children. Uh, with that, of course, came the, you know, 200 wives. Otherwise, ow and how, if it was just one person. Ow and how, you know? <laughs> it's guesstimated that Ramses had 96 sons and 60 daughters. Of all those children, Ramses outlived a lot of them. It's almost like living as a king helped, perhaps, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you ate better. Maybe, just a hint. Just an idea. Eventually, Ramses was succeeded by his 13th son with his favorite queen, Queen Nefertari, giving her the fanciest tomb in the Valley of the Queens. Nefertari's tomb contains paintings that some consider are the greatest works of ancient Egyptian art. Not bad, I had like baseball wallpaper on mine growing up. Tomb QV66, he spoiled his lady, look at this. We gotta love him. Her tomb is 520 square meters covered in beautiful art, but in 1904 when Nefertari's tomb was rediscovered, all that was found was her mummified knees. Yeah, all that was left was her kneecaps. What, like, who does this? Raiders had stolen all the treasure prior, sometime in the many moons she had been lying there, and they even took her body and left her knees. Like, what? Monsters. They're like, yeah, grab the treasure, leave the patellas, let's do it. Number eight, ready to strike. Pharaohs may have looked beautiful living in after death, but they meant business, okay? They were protective of their land, their family, their many, many lovers and children. The symbol often worn by pharaohs were symbols of power, a Nemes crown. This crown was a striped headcloth and the back of their head was covered with an aureus symbol, AKA an upside down cobra. The cobra symbol represents that the pharaoh is always ready and willing to attack their enemies attack them with venom. It's a pretty cool symbol. Mine just says DC Etnies Shoes. I'm like, I don't, this says fight me, if anything. DC Skate Shop in my back. I'm like, yeah, you can just attack me, that's cool. Number seven, King Teddy. The Pyramid of Teddy was built for the first ruler of the sixth dynasty. While it's not as flashy or massive as other pyramids, inside it contains the oldest writing ever, in the religious world, that is. Inside it contains the pyramid texts, these legendary texts. They go all the way back to 2400 BC. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this king, King Teddy, could ascend to the heavens after his death. This isn't bizarre behavior by any means, but King Teddy, he was specific. He wanted to be a star, like a literal star. There are spells and incantations that are in this tomb meant to free the king's soul as he arrives in the cosmos. More specifically for Teddy to become a star in the sky and join Osiris and Orion in the Hashtag God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to these heavens. It's one thing to be buried with your gold, then you can live another life, but to become a star? I need to expand my dreams, my gosh. King Teddy was onto something here. When I go, in my will, I'm gonna be like, can I become a star, is that possible? Can I just throw me up into the heavens? Can I do that? Or bury me, that's cool. Bury me in Ajax, that works. <laughs> Number six, Yozer. For this one, we're looking into some bowl worshiping. So if you're a fan of bowls, here, this one's perfect for you, weirdly enough. Just north of the Steppe Pyramid of Pharaoh Dozier, archeologist August Mariette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium, it's a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, and it's a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. This was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls, these bulls that were said to be sacred, of course, and after their death, they would become immortal. Immortal bulls, that sounds badass and also terrifying, that's very scary. Don't wear red around these guys. Tonight at Saqqara, there's a massive vault, it's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock, it's huge, and along the sides, there's 24 chambers, each with a sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Just impossible craftsmanship all around, especially at these times, like, oh my god, my wrists are tired just typing about this, let alone doing this. Inside these boxes were animal remains, bones and all that jazz, but back in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. You had to mummify them, right? Hence part one and where we are now. How are these tombs built so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and also, where do these bones come from? I have so many questions. Maybe on part three we'll answer them. Number five, we love cats. I'm allergic to cats, but I still go for it. I still pet them, I risk everything just to, yes, I don't care. I ruined my entire weekend just to get my face all up in their whiskers. Nobody did it like ancient Egyptians. You've probably heard this at one point or another. They worshipped cats. They were like, you know, the legendary <laughs> cats. That was, that was their thing. I'm more of a golden retriever guy, but I get it. They're cute. They respected them. They worshipped them. Even though at the time, dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. 
It's because they just stare at shit randomly. Mid conversation, a cat will just be like. No, they're not magical, they're terrifying. They're on something. If you had a cat, you had good luck, apparently. A friend of mine has two fat cats. He has some pretty good luck, I think. If they're fat, they're good? Hmm. When a cat passed away back in ancient Egyptian times, they too were mummified. You would think that alone was just plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs, they would obviously go a step further. Hence this fun list. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and would mourn them until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. That's, I, I got over my childhood animal in like six business days. It's not a bad thing, it's just that's a long time, you know? Next time your friend tells you their cat passed away, tell them if they really love them, they would shave their eyebrows. Test them. Number four, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, well, all the pharaohs were considered kings, but it was equal at the time. And they all look athletic. They all look like these warriors, right? They look to be in great shape. When in reality, a lot of these pharaohs were probably pretty overweight or unhealthy. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day, plus a little dab of honey every eight minutes, you're gonna gain some weight. Yeah, that's how it goes. Many of these ancient pharaohs did have diabetes, and Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong and all that jazz, but almost all historians agree that she was out of shape and quite unhealthy. Honestly, fair. I would do the exact same thing. She was ahead of her time. If somebody was like, hey, I'm gonna make a statue for you. What should I make it look like? I'm like, no, yeah, give him an eight pack. Make him jacked. I don't know. Make him look like Michael Jordan. I don't know. Number three, gender reveal parties. Okay, we've seen all these videos online. A guy goes to swing and hit a baseball. He misses, it hits the ground. There's a big pink cloud of smoke. Everyone's like, oh my God. Gender reveal parties, right? They're pretty popular. Turns out they're popular back in ancient Egyptian days. But nobody did it like them. Also, nobody started any wildfires back then when any uh, ancient Egyptians did it, so that's nice. We should go take a note from them. Back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. You would have to use wheat and barley seeds. You would have to pee on them. And then, however it grew, that would determine the sex. I would feel bad. First of all, I'd be like, hi, we're curious. Don't mind us. I'm just gonna pee on your crop, sir. Let us know how it grows. We're really we're aiming towards a boy this time. We have 96 girls, so we're gonna try a couple of boys. Yeah, depending on how the crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. And it worked a lot of the time. It's pretty wild. We went from watering crops to burning them down just to find out a gender. Hashtag it's a boy. Number two, more tattoos. More tattoos for number two. We love it. You guys saw what I did. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. We talked about that, the whole cat stuff and the whole hippo situation in part one, that was violent. But what about baboons? Did they get any love? Baboons, I say it weird, baboons, baboons. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. One of the most strange things pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Yep, stop resisting, you're going to jail. Me and seven baboons, let's carry them into the car, bam. Imagine stealing food for your family just to like try and get by and four baboons pop out, start doing parkour and then arrest you in front of everyone. That'd be so embarrassing and also alarming. They trained baboons to pick fruit, make beer and even entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party. Apparently their dance moves alone would be reason enough to get a tattoo on one of my arms, honestly. Going all crazy, throwing their own at people, I'd be like, yeah, right here or here. I don't care. And finally, number one, the afterlife. One of the most fascinating parts about these ancient Egyptian pharaohs is that they would pass away literally covered in gold, head to toe. It's nice to know that this long ago, some of these kings and queens still rest untouched by grave robbers or explorers. The afterlife for these pharaohs was important. And as soon as they take on the throne, work is immediately underway on their tomb. That's a little grim when you think about it. It's like, hey, congratulations. We're gonna start making where you're gonna be buried. It's like. Thanks, I think. These monuments took time, but they were built to last, and clearly, they have. Pharaoh's eyes were painted black with coal. They did this so that they would look like the god Horus after they passed on. Number 10, snake eyes. Well, not exactly snake eyes, but after extended use of belladonna drops in the eyes, you would probably wish that a snake bit you in the eyes. Belladonna is poisonous. It's a no calzone, red flag but yet it was still used by Egyptian royalty. Basically, the drops of poison would dilate your pupils, and that would be considered to be beautiful. For some reason, I guess, okay. Extended use of the drops had terrible side effects for the user, blindness being one of them. You gotta remember, folks in this time have no social security, and the best doctors can do for you is tell you to go take a bath in crocodile dung. 
and to pray to the gods for more, I guess. Sure, okay. So to avoid that tragedy, go for the natural look and avoid the eye drops. You'll thank me later. Number nine, more eye stuff. Thought I was done with the eye stuff? Ah, well, guess again, amigo. I ain't done yet. I've got lots more to say about that. Okay, maybe a little. Eyeshadow and eye color. Some ladies today would say no special outfit is complete without it. And honestly, I have to agree, ladies. Sometimes y'all do some stuff with your eyes that makes me say, damn, you look good. Damn, you look good. However, some ladies might be cautious to slap some color on their face if they knew the origins of the product. As for the royalty of Egypt, eye makeup was in. Seemed to be a trend. However, they weren't so cautious of where their makeup got its origins. Egyptian eye glitter had two key ingredients. Applicable powder and bugs. Yeah. You know the super colorful ones that are like really big and you wouldn't want to be around? Yeah, those. Beetles, scarabs, and pretty much anything you can find. They would then crush them into a heavenly pulp and smear it all over their royal faces. I have issues with spiders and wasps as it is. I have no interest in wearing them whatsoever. I actually hate wasps. That's just, you mean just crushing up a bunch of, and just, oh, this is good. Oh, I love this. This is the best. Yeah, no, don't do that. Number eight, sweet traps. When you're royalty of one of the most successful empires and civilizations in human history, it means you ain't gonna lift a finger. Less than any other celebrities do today, probably. So what to do with all that extra time in your hands instead of living like everyone else? Well, how about a picnic? That sounds nice, actually. Sounds great, right? Except when we bring out all of our favorite treats. The flies and bugs bother us, and we can't look beautiful if we're covered in bugs head to toe. How did the Egyptians fix this, you ask? Well, it's simple. Don't let the bugs bite you in the first place. Basically, you get one of your forced volunteers, maybe a couple, actually, and you slather the poor devils in honey till they look like your favorite pastry from Tim Hortons. Place that glazed serving away from the picnic, and now you can enjoy it in sunshine and peace. The screaming of being eaten alive by bugs might dampen the mood, so just, just wear earplugs, it's fine. Just You stay over there and just get eaten, it's fine. No problem. No problem. Number seven, unhooded Sith. Circumcision is important in a lot of cultures of yesterday and today. Now at this channel, my job is to come out here every week and make you laugh. So to the men out there who still have their Jedi robes, imagine every day of your life you got sand in places that sand shouldn't be. Anakin Skywalker's worst nightmare and honestly explains why he hates sand so much. But perhaps one of the reasons Egyptians used this hygiene service was to stop sand getting in their wiener's one-eyed bandit. There's no showers, nothing to really get it out once it's in there. That's no good. I guess you could take a dip in the Nile River, but uh, there's too many crocodiles in there, and who has the time to jump in the Nile River when they're busy being forced to build large structures that will stand the test of time? So you better line up, fellas, or be cursed to feel like Anakin Skywalker for the rest of your life. The prequel one, too, not the, not the cool animated one, the one that whines a lot. That one. You don't want to be that one. Number six, nice dentist. Turns out not all Egyptian dentistry is completely awful. It turns out they may have come up with the first toothbrush. Other civilizations had examples of one too, so it's hard to tell exactly, but the Egyptians had one. But one thing they did have over everyone else were Tic Tacs, or breath mints, actually. Honestly, this makes a lot of sense. Imagine it was Valentine's Day. You just walked past a large pyramid. There's sand in places on your body where sand just shouldn't be. When you notice the smell of your breath, and it's something awful. But not to worry, because you purchase breath mints from the market. Yes, that's right. Now smooching with your Egyptian sweetheart can go on without a hitch. The mints were made from nice smelling herbs and mints, sometimes roasted over a fire to form little candies. An ancient Egyptian solution to an ancient Egyptian problem. I kinda like that one actually, kinda nice. Gonna put a mint in, it's kinda nice. Number five. Well, I didn't have any corn. Austin Powers reference for you. You know the character I'm talking about, I can't say it. Here's a hygiene product that just makes me question life. The very fabric of our existence. Whether it was the Big Bang or the Almighty Creator, there's just no way this was ever meant to happen. I just, it doesn't make any sense. One day, somebody was walking along the Nile River and was unfortunate enough to step in crocodile droppings. Now, most people would say, gross, and move on. Oh, no, not the people of ancient Egypt. They felt the stinky, squishy unholiness on their feet and said, yes, we must bathe in this. <laughs> and they did. They took the forbidden mud bath, the brown tsunami, the cesspit of no hope. You can call it whatever you want, really. It's, it's horrible either way you look at it. Supposedly, it was meant to keep you young and beautiful. My only question would be at what point did they realize poo baths were a mistake? 
Was it when they were smelling it and it was bad? Or was it when it accidentally got in your mouth or something like that? And you're just like, oh, what? It, it walked up that out of my mouth. That's the Scottish Egyptian, in case you were wondering. Number four, waste removal. This one is kind of a broad stroke, but hear me out. There's no plumbing, no waste removal, and people kind of just go wherever they want. A lot of that unhygienic waste is kind of just laying about. However, the people of Egypt also had the advantage of the Nile River, which means they used that bad boy for everything. Transport, irrigation, a water source, and of course, a, a bathroom. Which in case you didn't know, your source of water and irrigation should be two separate, that, that shouldn't be, they shouldn't go together, that's not good. This is a good explanation for the plagues of Egypt, besides the sin, bad sinners, no sinning. As years of that kind of negligent waste management are liable to make any pharaoh sick. Don't mix your water with the poo, don't do that, that's bad, don't do that. Number three, sunscreen. This should come as no secret to anyone out there, but with my rosy cheeks and fair complexion, I would not do very well in the suns of ancient Egypt. Honestly, I don't know how Luke Skywalker lived on Tatooine with those twin sons. Without a little copper tone action, you know what I'm saying? The Egyptians had an answer to that problem, however. Not the whole living on Tatooine part, that, that just kind of sucks no matter what. Blue milk is weird. They had a makeshift sunscreen using rice bran extracts and a few other ingredients that were meant to help protect against the sun's rays. How effective was it really? Not sure, because the only stuff I'm willing to test out is the real stuff. And if I get burnt, then I start peeling. And then somebody has to rub aloe vera all over me. Be right back, I'm gonna get some sun. Number two, cursed craft dinner. You've got no plumbing in your palace, and it's time for dinner. So how does an Egyptian royal make his favorite pot of KD without water? I mean, if college kids can do it in their dorm room, surely they can master the art of post-secondary cuisine. Well, for some unlucky folks, it means taking a pot and walking down to that old Nile River. Almost like people rely on water or something. And take a big scoop of water and bring it back. But while you begin to scoop some water, you may notice someone is picking up crocodile dung. And people are bathing in the water. And, and to your left, there's a maiden washing clothes. And to your right, there's a man doing something I can't repeat on YouTube. Oh well, time to scoop some more water up and consume this clean, nice water at home. Oh, this is the best. Tastes like the village. It's nice. Number one, pink milkshake. Does it still count as hygiene if you ain't breathing? I say yes. Besides the pyramids and maybe the Nile, mummies are the most famous things about Egypt. And in a weird way, it is hygiene. Hygiene for the afterlife. When someone super important passes on, it's time for a little game of operation. Stomach, liver, intestines are removed and put into jars. You never know when you might need that next. The heart is left because it's the heart and the Egyptians were die-hard poets, so you got souls in there, you gotta keep that. The most grim process to me, however, is turning the human brain into a forbidden milkshake by mashing it with a small spike and then draining it out in what must have been the grossest waterfall ever. I, oh God, that just, oh God, that's so gross. <laughs> anyway, then you take some linen and start wrapping the mummy up like a dad wrapping last minute gifts on Christmas Eve. Bada bing, bada boom, there you go. Buddy is prepped for the afterlife. Uh, don't mind me, I'm just gonna be sick from the brain milkshake, ooh. Number 10, no lice. You know in elementary school when they would check everyone for lice and one poor sucker had to get their head shaved and walk around as that bald kid for like a month and would probably get bullied? Well that ain't gonna happen back in ancient Egypt because everyone shaved their heads to avoid lice back then and priests would shave their whole bodies just like Michael Phelps. Instead of having actual hair of their own, they would wear wigs. Wigs sometimes made of human hair. That honestly was a lot better in that harsh desert sun. Lice and other little pests like that, like fleas, were not wanted. And yeah, they still aren't. But it led to some honestly interesting solutions. For example, a warm potion of date meal and water was believed to drive away fleas and lice. They would use cat's fat to keep away mice, I made a rhyme, and one that probably actually did something was when they used a solution of natron water and salt in their humble abodes to eliminate and repel fleas. Number nine, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day, all night, and feel like I'm about to faint, obviously. Canada gets quite hot. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? What was their trick? They didn't have banana breeze, FPF, SPF 90, whatever the hell it is. Ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty, right? You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Think again, Laura. 
Their routine was written on tomb walls and scrolls. Rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol was used to block the sun off. Yeah, it was that hard. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. And ancient Greeks as well, they used olive oil as sunscreen as well as ancient Egyptians. Which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You'd be burnt and extremely dehydrated. But also, you'd have some nice tan lines and you wouldn't be as pale as me, so. It wasn't all bad. Number eight, the finest of cosmetics. The cosmetics of ancient Egypt were not just for looking good, they were for feeling good too. Like on the inside. Now, as such, those professionals who made the stuff took it pretty seriously. Not just because of a passion for the art, but also because they'd be judged pretty damn harshly if they did a bad job. If they sucked, it would mean having the whole neighborhood give you a bad reputation. And in the cosmetics business, just like show business, it's all about that reputation. It would also mean some harsh judgment from the big boys upstairs, meaning the gods when you met the afterlife. So yeah, they wanted to do a good job. And to meet that end, they would try and use the finest of ingredients, as they should when people have to put this stuff on their skins and right next to their eyes and stuff. Number seven, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was born, what did people even do to smell good? What, I don't, what happened? Deodorant was actually first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide. It was stored in a metal container, nothing like speed stick at all. It wasn't discreet or anything. It was bad, but ancient Egyptians, eh, even worse. They had to use ostrich eggs when it came to smelling good in the pits. They made perfumes as well and were among the first to use any type of deodorant. So that's, that's a pretty good start. Thank you. Thank you so much, ancient Egyptians. Hence the ostrich egg factor. They had to start somewhere. They mixed a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shell, and then nuts, and bam, there you go. You're ready for the day. Just pop it on. Another method was a little more yummy than the ostrich eggs and nuts method. Egyptians would use porridge balls. Yeah, flavored porridge rolled up and securely tucked under your arms. Honestly, that seems like a better alternative. Sometimes when you put antiperspirants or like deodorant on, it gets like all, it all crumbles apart. It's like feta cheese all of a sudden. You're like, what happened to this stick? I want, I would rather have porridge balls than just call it a day, boom. Number six, get this man a Tic Tac or something. Just like I use mints to cure my nasty tea breath, which I argue is worse than coffee breath, the ancient Egyptians used breath mints to keep things fresh. Honestly, they actually sound kind of good. Frankincense, cinnamon, melon, pine seeds and cashews put together, ground up and bound together in candy using honey. <laughs> Just heat that bad boy over the fire and let it cool and boom, breath mints. I like it. I like it a lot. These breath mints would be made commercially by those fine cosmeticians and dentists. Or they could even be made at home. Some archaeological finds of bowls, jars, and other dishes suggest that they may have been candy dishes that would hold the lovely taste in little suckers. Always gotta keep things fun, fresh, and flirty back in ancient Egypt. Breath mints would certainly help you do the trick. <laughs> nice. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and also ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step online on how to make your own loincloth, because that's apparently what I do on my free time. Thank you for asking. And it's a bit more complicated than I thought. It's way more, it's way more complicated than just throwing on sweatpants or even, you know, the towel fold like a toga. This had numerous steps. We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather to make underwear. That's a fun little fact right there. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the hot sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but I'll let Adam tell you about that one another time. That's more of a, that's more of a home one. Number four, food as medicine. Trying to prevent bad things before they happen, it is a very human skill to have. And when it comes to preventative medicine, the Egyptians had some methods. One more obvious solution is diet. Eating the right stuff truly does help lead to a longer life, but eating the specific right stuff can directly prevent certain issues. As a prime example, the laborers that would build the massive iconic structures we know Egypt for today were kept fed with diets that include a lot of onion, garlic, and radishes. Now, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians knew the chemicals these foods contained, or if they just put two and two together, but onions, garlic, and radishes contain, uh, why did I do this to myself, contain allostatin, allicin, and raffinin which are very helpful when it comes to preventing diseases in the super crowded working and living conditions the laborers existed in. That Allison really helps. Another example would be to cure night blindness. In these circumstances, doctors fed their patients powdered liver, which is rich in vitamin A, which is a vital nutrient for vision. 
Again, I don't know if they knew it contained that specific fang or if they were just like, hmm, I eat liver and I can see better. Discovery! Number three, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with an interesting method to getting rid of those pimples. Now, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, and physicians back then discussed pimples as such. Ready for this? They called them these elevated spots, with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing said spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were referred to as maggots. That's what they thought they were back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots, thanks. No, no thank you, that's pretty horrible, that's a horrible reference. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. I would faint, I would be so sick. If a physician told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses anywhere on my body, I would throw up, I'd pass out, I'd be so upset. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, you have common acne, mm, maybe you're turning into a pigeon, who knows? Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds all to get rid of acne. Yeah, sounds like a horrible alternative. I would much rather just have acne. Maggots? Dude, I'm done with this channel. I'm out of here. That's so gross. Number two, eye makeup. Almost everybody and their mums knows that the Egyptians wore that crazy awesome eye makeup. But what you might not know is that it didn't just serve the purpose of making you look absolutely stunning. No, a lot of these eye makeups were lead based. Now, that sounds pretty bad, I can't lie. It does, and it likely was for some, but it was possible that it boosted nitric oxide by up to 240% in cultured human skin cells. I don't know what cultured human skin cells means, but that's the quote. If you know, let me know down below. What the heck does nitric oxide do? Well, that I do know. It helps to boost up your immune system to fight diseases, which, guess what? That's pretty important, especially in the marshy areas around the Nile where eye infections are actually pretty darn common. What's cool is that research suggests the Egyptians actually knew that and specifically synthesized the makeup for this purpose. Huh, <laughs> neat. Finally, number one, mummification. Back in the day, mummification was common, and even today we're finding more mummies. Like, literally last month, we just unraveled six more. It's crazy. We're uncovering more ancient history, which is great, but how exactly was this process done? We're talking about back maggots and stuff. What, what did they think about this? How did this even begin a, to be a thing? Well, it wasn't cheap for starters. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's a pretty brutal process as well. What you would do is you would put a hook, or well, they would put a hook in your nose after you'd passed away, and then they would pull out your brain and all that just squishy stuff, just out all through this thing right here. And then they would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all those goods, all the organs, boom, see ya, gone. And while those are drying, you would put your lungs and liver in jars. And then you would put the heart back in the body. And then you would wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that stuff, turpentine, turpentines, all the time and teens, just all in there washing it out. Then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days. That's a long time. But around day 40, you would stuff it with sand. Now come day 70, finally, that's when you wrap them in the mummy bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits forever, really. And then there's just jars of organs also stored in your burial chamber. Now it's, we don't do it, it's not as fun anymore. We don't put our organs in jars. We don't stuff anyone with sand. We should, you know what? We should bring I back mummies. Let's just do should. it. I think it's time. Yeah. Kicking off the list at number 10, got a passport. Ramses II is known as one of the greatest ancient Egyptian rulers of all time. He was called Ramses the Great, so that's a good sign already. At a young age, he fought in harsh battles to protect the borders of Egypt, and during his reign, the Egyptian army reached 100,000 men. That's a pretty large army. He was later referred to as the Great Ancestor, and it didn't take long for Ramses II to declare himself a god. God. It's always fun being like, hey, by the way, I'm a god now. That's how cool I am. 30 years into his ruling, Ramses was ritually turned into an Egyptian god. It was a formal thing. Though it wasn't until 3,000 years later until Ramses would truly soar through the skies. He was buried in his treasure after 96 years of living, and in 1974, he finally started to show signs of aging. Not too bad. He went from being on display to being sent to Paris to get a glow up, you know, to preserve the king's body even longer. Instead of being listed as luggage on the way to Paris, the pharaoh was given an official Egyptian passport for the commute. The government gave a mummy a passport. This is like the first five minutes of a horror film. Under occupation, it even said king. And there was even a small disclaimer noting that he was in fact still dead. You can never be too sure, you know? Number nine, 
baboon tattoos. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. This is common knowledge now at this point. We've heard about their love towards cats, which I'll explain later on, but what about baboons? Yeah, they were pretty important pieces to this ancient puzzle as well. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. Now, one of the most strange things that pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Imagine stealing a pair for your family and then four baboons start doing parkour chasing you down. That's so alarming. I would just throw it and be like, please stop. You're so scary and strong. They trained baboons to pick fruit, they trained them to make beer, and they also trained them to entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to tattoo one on my arm. So you know what? I get it. Get a Harambe tattoo. I'm like, you know, I, it's, I, I see it. I see the similarities. Number eight, worship dung beetles. So worshiping a baboon that dances and makes holiday ales, yeah, I can see how one would worship such a creature. That makes sense. But pharaohs also worship dung beetles and their reasoning may surprise you. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way naturally. Animals are born with natural instincts. Sea turtles race to the sea. These guys follow the cosmos. It's pretty wild. It's one thing to follow the sun naturally because it gives off warmth. Sunflowers will literally turn their head to find the sun, which is super creepy, but it's beautiful. These insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their poop towards it. They'd be like, hello Milky Way, and they just... Hieroglyphs of these beetles are seen all over. Like near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, for example, there's a massive scarab monument. And today, if you walk around it nine times, you get good luck. And don't worry, you don't have to roll any droppings at the same time. Don't get dizzy, that's all, it's the only rule. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which ancient Egyptians believed was the sun. I grew up thinking the sun was a baby, but that's because I watched Teletubbies, so, you know, it depends. Number seven, surprise each other. Cleopatra and Julius Caesar were a pretty beneficial couple, to say the least. Cleopatra would use Caesar's armies, which in turn would allow her to rule Egypt, while Caesar was eyeing down Cleopatra's extreme wealth. They were the perfect pair. She was able to financially support Caesar enough for him to return to power back in Rome, but how did such a perfect pair meet in the first place? Did Cleopatra swipe right? Hmm, no. Well, a then 52-year-old Julius Caesar visited the much younger Cleopatra, so she then sent a surprise gift to his chambers. She got her crew to roll her up in a carpet or bed sheet, that's not really confirmed, something along those lines, and then delivered her to his door, completely nude. He unraveled a naked Cleopatra, and he's like, okay, hello. That's pretty impressive. Cleopatra was down for fun surprises. While we don't recommend this as an approach ever, it's one worth mentioning on our list. Number six, gender reveal parties. We've all seen those videos. A guy goes to hit a baseball, he misses it, the baseball breaks and there's pink dust all around his feet and he starts crying, it's wonderful. Gender reveal parties were quite popular, you know, until they started lighting wildfires. But back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. Instead of peeing on a pregnancy test, you would have to use wheat and barley seeds instead. Depending on how those barley crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. They were right 85% of the time, which is quite impressive back in the day. We went from watering crops to burning them. Hashtag, it's a boy. Number five, space knife. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with the king. Now, like I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon to be buried with your treasure or belongings. It's why ancient Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so grave robbers can't just sneak in after you pass away and then take all of your goodies. So two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other with gold. Now, with iron being more rare than gold during the Bronze Age, this was quite a big deal. With recent advancements in technology, we're able to use a technique called portable X-ray fluorescent spectrometry, and according to the journal Meteorites and Planetary Science, the blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that its material is that of extraterrestrial origin. A blade fell from the sky, and now a king has it. That's pretty insane. Also, aliens? Just saying. Number four, KB-55. Also located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KB-55, was found by Edward Arton back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason that we call this tomb by a number rather than a name is because we really don't know for sure who's inside. Even the walls of the tombs inside, they aren't covered with beautiful hieroglyphs to tip us off on their history or their ruling, it's just bare. The only hint as to who is buried remains on the walls. It's one hieroglyph that remains, and it was discovered also in 1907, and it translates simply to, the evil one shall not live again. That's very scary, that's 
Definitely scarier than Greg was here. I don't know. Even massive stones were built and set up in order to prevent anything from getting out. Whereas usually with ancient tombs, it's the opposite. So that's pretty scary. The description for those inside the tomb has also been destroyed. So we have really no idea who's in KB55 or what. <laughs> Number three, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens and they look athletic. They look to be in great shape, when in reality, these pharaohs were probably quite obese. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day and you have baboons dancing around, plus a little dab of honey every, I don't know, eight minutes, yeah, you're gonna gain some weight. Many of these ancient pharaohs had diabetes. And Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong, but historians all agree that she was out of shape and extremely unhealthy. Honestly, I would do the exact same if I was there back then. She was ahead of her time. If somebody made a statue for me, I'd be like, yeah, give it an eight pack, make him extremely jacked and seven two. Can we do that? Sure, no one's gonna ask questions. I'm Dwayne The Rock Johnston, just write it down, please. Number two, worship cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still love them. I still pet them. I ruined my entire night just to get my face right there next to their cute little furry face. But ancient Egyptians, like I said earlier, really loved cats. They respected them, they worshiped them. Even though at the time dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. So if there's ever a cat versus dog argument going on on your end of the screen, cats win. I'm allergic and I'm still saying cats win. That's, that's huge. If you had a cat, it means you had good luck. When cats passed away, they too were mummified back in the day. You would think that alone was plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs went a step further. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and then mourn until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. Next time your friend tells you that their cat passed away, tell them that if they really love them, they'll shave their eyebrows off and then see what they say. Also, you don't have to make your friends shave their eyebrows. Let's leave this one in the past. That's fun. Just be sad with eyebrows. Be like, hmm. Number one, fight a hippo. Egypt's first pharaoh, Menes, although we know next to nothing about his history, there is something there that has historians scratching their heads to this day. At his early time, the pharaoh was setting out to unite all of Egypt under his rule. The time that he ruled as well is considered a rather peaceful time when comparing it to years later. We know that he was well respected, and we also know that after his 63 years of peaceful ruling, he was stomped to death by a hippo. That's horrible, it's a horrible way to go out. He was an elderly ruler at that time. He was surrounded by guards and somehow a hippo got all the way to his chambers. A hippo, and then ended the pharaoh's life. Some suggest that the reason there's nothing written about this pharaoh's tragic, horrible demise is because it's possible that the hippo was his pet. This is why you don't try and tame a beast as a pet. Perhaps this was an early similar situation as the Siegfried and Roy tiger attack. Just stick to smaller magical cats. They're much safer, they won't stop you to death. Oh my god, it's horrible. Number 10, overshadowed and the beard. Hatshepsut for a long while was content to play the supporting role among Egypt's royals. But when she decided she wasn't anymore, things took a turn. She was the daughter of Thutmose I and wife slash sister to her half brother Thutmose II. I know, don't worry, I'll address it later in the video, stay tuned. When he died in 1479 BC and left their son as heir, she took on the role as regent to Thutmose III. But she basically just acted as the rightful ruler. As the young king came of age finally, she declared herself pharaoh. The strangest part was that she chose to portray herself in pictures as a man with a male body and a false beard. She said that the god Amun was her father and insisted that he commanded her to take charge of Egypt. Who's gonna argue with a god, right? But no one could quite explain the issue with the beard. Nevertheless, during her reign, it was a time of peace and prosperity for Egypt. Number 9, Sesostris. Sesostris was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, who was celebrated for the extent of his conquests. He stretched the kingdom further than anyone before him, but he was not without his quirks. According to accounts by Herodotus, Sesostris left pillars on every battlefield. Along with the usual bragging and boasting of how he won, he would carve into them images of genitalia, like people do on the bathroom stalls, you know? If he thought that his enemy fought valiantly, he carved a If he thought they didn't put much of a fight, he would carve a Great. Yeah, that just goes to show what he thought about things, huh. The latter was a sign of disrespect for his subdued enemies, while the other was a sign of honor, like, hey man, 
You stuck it to me. Apparently, some even stood the test of time, lasting over 1,500 years, and seen firsthand by Herodotus himself. For those of you who don't know, for reference, Herodotus is considered as the father of historians, one of the very first to take up the task. Number eight, ceremonial seating. The whole idea behind the pharaohs was that they were direct descendants from the gods themselves. Therefore, they too had deific powers and had the capability of restoring life to the land. The Nile River had significant importance to the people of Egypt. It provided fertile soil and water irrigation it was pretty awesome. In order to ensure its abundance would continue, pharaohs would organize a festival where they would ceremoniously fill it with their seed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Some historians believe that this was in honor of the creation story of how life came to be and therefore it was kind of like a fertility festival. Crowds would gather at the Nile and await the arrival of their pharaoh. They would then disrobe and give their pleasure into the river to ensure its bounty. Some historians say it was just the pharaoh who did this while others say that the men joined in after. Evidence still remains pretty slim as to whether this really did happen so take this one with a grain of salt but that's not to say that there isn't any evidence at all that it did happen. So there. Number seven, deliver me naked. Cleopatra is known as one of the most beautiful women in history, but this could be due to how she used her feminine wiles to get what she wanted. Her beauty and cunning became renowned as a result. While other queens, like the one I mentioned before, concealed their beauty, Cleopatra was all about showing it off, cause girl, if he got it, flaunt it. In order to help secure the political ally and power connected to Caesar, Cleopatra knew how to make an entrance and knew how to win over a guy. It's, it's pretty easy. He was around 52 when they met and the Egyptian queen was just like 20 and in her prime, so she looked great. She smuggled herself into Alexandria where Caesar was staying, had her servant tie her up in a bed sack, naked, and carried indoors to Caesar and she was like, have at her buddy. In other words, she wrapped her naked body in a carpet, made Caesar's jaw drop to the floor, and secured one of the most beneficial unions on the spot. Honestly, not really messed up. Kind of badass. Honestly, just do your thing. Work it, girl. I dream of having that confidence with my clothes on. You know what I mean? Go girl, you got this, you get that empire. Number six, Cats and the Battle. Ancient Egypt would have welcomed the film the adaptation of Cats, unlike the rest of the world, with open arms and probably would have built a shrine to it. Giant human cats eating human cockroaches would be revered. Bottom line, cats in ancient Egypt were worshipped and treated like family. It was considered a crime punishable by death to harm one due to the belief in the goddess Bastet. One pharaoh even risked losing a battle because of cats themselves. The Battle of Pelusium of 525 BCE between Pharaoh Samek III and the Persian king Cambyses II resulted in the first Persian conquest of Egypt all because of cats. Cambyses took advantage of the cat loving side of Egypt and used hostages of cats and animals as leverage. So they were just kind of like, well we can't we can't fight if the cats are let loose. What are we going to do? We can't kill the cats. And that's that's uh, how they lost that battle. Number 5, honey coated. Who here hates bugs bothering them in the summer? Unless they're a bumblebee, because we love bumblebees here, right guys? But me too. No one likes the buzzing of blood suckers nipping at your skin while you're chilling out on the beach or barbecue. Well, guess what? Egyptian pharaohs hated it too, except they didn't have bug spray. So what did they do? Well, you know the phrase, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? Well, they took that literally. Conveniently, they had servants around them at all times, so to help with the bug problem, they covered them with honey so as to distract the bees and the bugs. So as the pharaohs lounged on the sand, or wherever they were, their dutiful servants took on the job of taking on the bug bites. King Pepe, for instance, had a dedicated slave in his entourage who endured it every day. Poor guy. It was so effective that he had one designated in each room. Poor guys. Number four, assassins. This wasn't necessarily something that he did, but something that happened to him that was pretty messed up. As you can guess from the title, it involved assassins. Ramses III had a lot on his plate during his reign. There were this group of seafarers trying to destroy everyone. The tomb builders did their first labor strike over wage delays. I get you. The economy was deteriorating. Weather was devastating. Food production. Things were corrupt as hell. And 
And on top of all this, his secondary wife, T.A., hated his guts. She, along with a dozen members of his harem, the head of the treasury, a military captain, a butler, the butler did it, and the chief royal chamberlain, hatched an assassination plot. In 2012, researchers used a high powered CT scanner on Ramsey's mummy and saw a massive throat gash covered by an amulet said to have healing powers. The researchers summarized that an assassin cut through Ramsey's esophagus and trachea, killing him practically instantly because he probably would have just let out that fast. Some other research suggests that this happened before the other assassination plot unraveled, but either way, not a good way to go. Number 3. Till death do us part. Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning? Well. If you were servant to a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, you were hoping that your dude lived a long time because once they bite the dust, so did you. Now keep in mind, ancient Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife. So when you died, you didn't just disappear, you literally just traveled to another world. That's the whole idea behind religion anyway. The discovery team organized by NYU, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania discovered macabre evidence of this tradition. While excavating the mortuary ritual site of Pharaoh Aha, they found six graves not far from his tomb. They were skeletons of court officials, servants, artisans who appear to have been sacrificed to serve the Pharaoh in the afterlife. Aha's successor, Dajir, had more than 200, which are also presumed to be sacrificial burials as well. Number two, Marrying your siblings. Again, remember the thing I mentioned before and now I'm actually getting to it? I promised, I promised, and here we are. Not so long ago, it was normal to court your very own cousin, but today that would be considered a very large taboo. I'm not gonna lie, it gives me the skippies, okay? I don't like imagining ma even marrying any of my cousins, that's weird to me. But the ancient Egyptians took things even farther, or should I say brought it closer, by marrying their very own siblings. Hey. That's one way to guarantee that the line will stay in the family. But knowing what we know about the genetic pool being too close and the complications that can arise, there's things that can go wrong. But nevertheless, it happened. DNA testing from King Tut's corpse revealed that he was a product of a union between two siblings. Pharaohs believed that they were descended from the gods. Therefore, keeping it in the family was crucial in maintaining that bloodline. King Tut even married his own half-sister, same dad, when he was just 10 years old. However, generations of inbreeding resulted in a bone disease that got more severe each time. Cleopatra also married her own brother as well. That was a that was a whole thing, and then she met Caesar and that whole thing we talked about. Yeah, that thing. Let's move on. Number one, Akhenaten. One of the most polarizing figures in Egyptian history, Akhenaten tried to get rid of religion and as a result, they got rid of him. Akhenaten earned the title of heretic king and a recent discovery has revealed that his deeds might have been a lot darker. Akhenaten came to power in the 1350s and reigned for around 17 years. He is known for creating a new religion surrounding Aten, who was generally represented as a sun disk. Sometime around his fourth year, he started sending out agents to erase names and images of certain gods from existing texts and monuments. Around the fifth year, he claimed to discover the location of the new royal city and moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, today known as Tel El Amarna. There, his people suffered greatly under slave labor, with bodies being uncovered younger than 20, many with bones broken, spines broken, along with evidence of severe malnutrition. When the pharaoh finally passed, his tomb remained unfinished and his name was stricken from the history books. At least now, we can see why. Number 10, Tutankhamun. This guy is arguably the most famous Egyptian pharaoh. So what is he doing at the top of the list? Well, King Tut wasn't famous for anything he really did in his lifetime. I mean, he was a young pharaoh, but someone on this list was technically pharaoh since he was two. No, he wasn't famous for anything he really did. Instead, Tutankhamun's tomb, discovered in 1922, was one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever. It was almost entirely intact, and his sarcophagus was incredible. Tutankhamun only lived to the age of 20, and how he lost the spark of life is actually still a mystery. He may not have done much other than a lot of religious reforms, but he managed to find another way of living forever. Number 9. Djoser so, with King Tut, he didn't really do much in his short lifetime. With Djoser, we actually don't really know a lot of what he did. Also like Tutankhamun, it was what he did for and after his departure from life that made him famous. Djoser was responsible for the construction of the Limestone Step Pyramid at Saqqara, the first of its kind. It was a huge architectural achievement. 
A building that stays structurally sound no matter how big it gets? Well, knock me down and call me Susan. The pyramid was actually completed after he lost the will to live by his official Imhotep. Number 8. Amenhotep III Okay, on to the members of the list who we know did something significant for Egypt during their time on the earth. Amenhotep III ruled an artistically and financially successful Egypt. He had pretty stellar reviews on Google for his trade relations which boosted up the economy of Egypt. But it was his artistic side that got him a bit more of a lasting recognition. He is the pharaoh with the most statues of himself. He created tons of monuments and a lot of stone scarabs that still hold up with tons of stories of historical events. I want some statues myself. Is, is that weird? Probably. Number 7. Hatshepsut Now look, women in Egypt had high status and were respected more than in other parts of the world at the time. But a female pharaoh, while not unheard of, was unfortunately still pretty rare. Hatshepsut here was known as the most successful of those female pharaohs. Her father, King Thutmose I, wanted her to inherit the throne, and to that end, she was brought up learning how to lead. She reigned for 21 years after the death of her husband, and everything she did, from tons of construction projects to creating trade routes, went off without a single hitch. The people of Egypt lived in peace for her entire rule. Number 6. Thutmose III Thutmose III was, surprisingly, the son of Thutmose II, who was the husband of Hatshepsut. You know, number 7, the most successful female pharaoh. So that's the kind of cloth we're working with here. Thutmose was only two when his father bit the dust. So while he was technically the next pharaoh, his stepmother took over with him as co-ruler. This guy's contributions to the Egyptians were tremendous though. He was literally called the Napoleon of Egypt, which Shouldn't Napoleon be the Thutmose the Third of France? Either way, Thutmose the Third. He helped expand Egypt like none before. He was a dope warrior, and he helped in the construction of a lot of stuff. Most importantly, the Temple of Karnak. That's how you make Mama proud. Number five, Xerxes the First. You've most likely heard of this guy. If not from his historically inaccurate portrayal in 300, then at least from one or two history classes. But Adam, wasn't he the emperor of Persia? Yeah, well guess what my little bees, Egypt was part of the Persian Empire, which makes him pharaoh as well. This guy gets a pretty bad rap in history, but who wrote that history? The Greeks who despised him for his attempted invasion of Greece. Oh, I'm not saying he was great or anything, in fact, he had a bit of a disregard for the traditions of the Egyptians and their way of life. But you cannot tell me that he was not significant in history. Xerxes the Great makes this list for his infamy more than anything else. Number 4. Akhenaten So this is going to be the second not so beloved pharaoh on this list. But disdain for Akhenaten didn't come from war, or the fact that his massive army was defeated by a group of a couple hundred Greeks. No, Akhenaten here was infamous for his devout following of a singular god, Aten, the god of the sun. He actually moved the capital of Egypt to a new location that he titled Akhetaten, or Horizon of Aten. And he kind of made everyone else worship the single god Aten as well. He was famous for a different reason though. Akhenaten was married to Nefertiti. She played a huge part in his religious plans, and she is well known in history for the limestone bust that was made of her, and has been copied so many freaking times. Number 3. Khufu When you think of Egypt, there is likely one thing that pops straight into your mind. If you say anything other than the Great Pyramids of Giza, you do not pass go, you do not collect $200, and you lose. Khufu is the pharaoh you have to thank for this wonder of the ancient world. We still sort of don't know exactly how it was constructed, but this goliath limestone and mud brick structure was the tallest building in the world for like 4,000 years. It was built as the housing for his tomb and as his stairway to heaven. No, not the Led Zeppelin song. It has three chambers inside of it plus a gallery that we've discovered so far. As for what else Khufu contributed to ancient Egyptian life, we don't have much in the way of texts about that yet. But if this is the main thing, then I mean, I'd take it. Number 2. Cleopatra. How could she not be on this list? She was the very last pharaoh Egypt ever had, and she was arguably one of the most famous ones. 
Not only becoming a figure in history, but a character in literature, theater, and media. Cleopatra VII was pharaoh in Egypt from 51 to 30 BC, and it was one hell of a reign. She introduced tons of reforms to improve the Egyptian economy. She was an awesome diplomat and a scholar. She didn't have things too easy though. Having to fight her own brother for the throne and having to do some diplomacy with various famous Romans. Things kind of fizzled out near the end, but she certainly ended the line of Egyptian pharaohs with a beloved bang, as was her style. Number 1. Ramses II Alright, this one was definitely the one I thought of first. Ramses II is arguably the most famous of all the pharaohs. He reigned for 67 years. He had 96 children. He had a crazy successful military campaign conquering the Hittites, Syrians, and Nubians. No other pharaoh that we know of has been able to build like he has. He lived to the age of 90, which is insane for back then. And he professed himself a god, which I'm sure some people actually believed. Even today, when we moved his remains to France for restoration, he had to be given a passport that literally said, King, deceased, under the occupation. Truly an incredibly influential pharaoh. Number 10, false doors. Okay, right off the bat, imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb, all right? Imagine you've spent years of your life dedicating to this research, and then you find a door. You find an entrance carved into the wall, and this is it. What lies beyond? It's time. You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it's a fake door. It's a false door. Yeah, just a Looney Tunes door. Somebody juked you out 4,500 years ago. Gotcha. Their spirit's been waiting that long to be like, nice, idiot. All right, we can go. We're good. False doors in Egyptian tombs were quite common in ancient Egyptian times. But if we look elsewhere throughout history, we find false doors in ancient Rome, in both tombs and the interior of homes. So that ought to be confusing for any house guests back then. It's also important to note that Egyptian culture was influenced by Mesopotamian architecture. So we've had fake doors around for a while now. A lot of confusing people for thousands of years. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead, and that spirits were able to travel here and there throughout living and death. Most false doors can be found in the West Wall because Egyptians believed the West to be the land of the dead. Number 9. The Tomb of Uzer Back in March 2010, the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities released this photo. This six foot tall slab of pink granite was carved over 3,500 years ago, and this door was found near Karnak Temple in Luxor, and originally it belonged to the chief minister of Queen Hatshepsut back in the 15th century. Now, Uzer was a high ranking official and held the position of vizier for 20 years at that time, so in turn, he got his own fancy tomb located on the west bank of the Nile. Remember, Egyptians associate the west with the land of the dead. That's gonna come in quite a few times in this video. The actual slab of granite, this door, was found far away from its home. It had been moved thousands of years later and ended up in an ancient Roman era building. Never thought I'd have to say this, but um, don't steal doors from the dead. Got it? Okay, let's move on. Number eight, Alexandria Black Tomb. What if we found a tomb and then just opened it, you know? What if we found a mysterious black granite tomb in Alexandria, say back in 2018? Do you think it would be wise to just open it because we're curious? Spoiler alert, we opened it and it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. When archaeologists found this massive tomb untouched for over thousands of years, on one hand, yeah, that's a feat in itself, but us humans, we're curious creatures. We just gotta, just a little peek just to see who's in there. I mean, after all, it could be Alexander the Great, right? That's the whole point of all this. Egyptian news outlet El Watan reported that the tomb was lifted only a few centimeters before every official involved at that construction site just fled the scene. They straight up just ran away. It smelled that bad. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, this guy put his entire head in the tomb just to show us that it's safe. That's great. I mean, you could use your hand, maybe even a foot, I guess, just a little foot dip. But straight to the head dipping? Come on, Mr. Waziri, be smart about this. Number seven, Valley of the Kings. While March 2020 wasn't the best month of all time by any means, Egyptian officials did locate a secret vault hiding in the sands of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Just off the west bank of the Nile, the Valley of the Kings, as its name hints towards, is a pretty historical part of Egypt's past. Again, do we want to open this vault? Probably not, but did we? Yes. Bones and goo and history. What do you know? Surprise, surprise. Number six, 2020 tombs. Summer 2020, nice. While most of us was stuck inside watching Netflix, more than 100 sealed coffins were found. And yes, they were occupied for the most part. 
Found, of course, in Saqqara, Egypt, Egyptian archaeologists have never been more excited. Maybe we'll find the body of Cleopatra. Wouldn't that just be dandy? The fact that we found over 100 of these still in great shape is mind-blowing. Grave robbers have been around since ancient Egyptian days, and for all of these to be untouched for this long is honestly unbelievable. These findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations. That's what makes this so insane. Like Persians and Greeks, they were all around at this time. The idea that we're finding mummies is great and all, but again, do we need to open all of them up? Maybe there's treasure, maybe there's bodies. Either way, it's not yours. <laughs> Am I insane? Maybe I'm insane. Do we need to find Alexander the Great this badly that we're willing to disrespect this many souls in the process? Number five, Luxor tomb. We've been saying 2,500 years ago, and don't get me wrong, that's an awful long time to go, but in 2014, archaeologists discovered a 4,000-year-old tomb from the 11th dynasty, tucked away in Luxor, Egypt, of course, as this list says. Spanish archaeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty, and it's pretty obvious that this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high-ranking official, because at the time, Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt, and officials also believed this tomb could have been used as a mass grave. The important thing to note here is that the tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty because tools and utensils from that later time were also found in this grave. We're gonna find a spork in 5,000 years and be like, ah yes, ancient tools, interesting. Number four, 210 sarcophagi. So we thought it was a pretty big deal when 160 bodies were recently discovered in Egypt. This was back in September 2020. Over 160 coffins were found. Wild, right? Well, those are rookie numbers, turns out. For this one, archaeologists found 210 sarcophagi near Queen Nefertiti's funerary temple in the city of the dead, Saqqara. Yeah, there were over 160, surprise. Maybe next time you check in with us, that number will be even higher. Who knows? Hopefully, slash maybe hopefully not. I don't know how I feel about this. This was January 2021. We probably would have seen it on the news, but that was when 768 people were storming the capital, so the news was a bit busy, I guess. Thanks. These sealed coffins were untouched for thousands of years. They went from finding 160 to finding 210. That's incredible. According to the ministry, the sarcophagi were completely closed and haven't been opened since they were buried at all. They opened a few though, of course, just to analyze and display them, but that's it. Yeah, leave the rest. I'm not focused on ancient curses or Brennan Fraser having to come out and save the day. Just let dead people lay where they are. Let them rest. The amount of effort got into hiding and preserving their memory alone. I mean, look how long it's taken for us to even find these things. It's almost like they didn't want to be found. Number three, the ancient curse. The walls of some of these tombs have warnings from the gods, which is a lot. One of them warning trespassers that the gods will wring their neck like that of a goose. Also, if I walked into somebody's property now and it said trespassers' necks will be wrung out like a goose, I would turn back. I wouldn't want to investigate further. I would just walk away. You don't need to be an ancient god to get that message across, you know what I mean? But inside the found tomb of the vizier Ankhamor, a pharaoh's official from 4,000 years ago, a curse was written. Buried in a mastaba, an above-ground massive tomb, was this warning. Might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It also warns of the vizier's knowledge of secret spells and magic, and threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing a ghost. Yeah, there's that, or beware of dog. I don't know, you can pick which is more impactful on your property, sure. Number two, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, as you may have guessed, in the Valley of the Kings. You're getting good, nice. But this one doesn't sound like the rest. I mean, for starters, it's a number rather than a name. What in the Elon Musk is happening here? Whose name was a number, huh? KV-52 was discovered in 1906 by Edward Ayrton. Tomb KV-50, KV-51, and this one, KV-52, they all form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Underneath six feet of debris, the entrance to these vaults were found, so when we enter this tomb, specifically KV-52, that's been untouched, ideally, for thousands of years, we can look forward to finding anything. In fact, whatever we do find, it's a win. It helps complete this age-long puzzle. So when officials opened KV-52 and it was completely empty, well, that doesn't feel too nice. Something here is wrong. It was empty except for two boxes. Both were black and undecorated, which is odd considering what we've learned on this list. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey, and the smaller one was a canopic chest that had four compartments in it. Hauntingly bare compared to what else we've seen on this list, but it gets a little better. We're not done yet. Finally, number one, Queen Nefertiti's hidden chamber. When researchers are 90% sure about something, that's a pretty good sign. You only say you're 90% sure of something when you know for sure, for sure. You leave 10% in case anything else goes wrong out of your control, right? 90%, that's confident, we got this. So when Egyptian authorities said they're 90% sure there's a hidden chamber in King Tut's tomb, well, we got a little jazzed, a little 
Got some jazz hands going on. Not gold, jazz hands. Back in 2015, a paper was published on the burial of Queen Nefertiti. Archaeologist Nicholas Reeves argued that while conducting scans on the ancient site, Reeves found what resembled traces of doors beneath the plaster. Now, it's been considered previously by archaeologists that King Tut's mask, having ear piercings and all, suggests that at that time, that tomb and that death mask was actually meant for Queen Nefertiti, not King Tut. But because King Tut died suddenly when he was 19, plans had to quickly change. 90% sure is good enough for me. What do you guys think? Comment down below all your thoughts. We're gonna start with peace treaties. Egyptologists know Ramses II as the pharaoh who restored Egypt's relations with Syria and built a lot of neat temples in the desert back in the 1200s BC. And he's the one in that Disney movie whose first son gets smoked by the plague. Kind of a wild guy, so we'll talk about him quite a bit in this vid. Anyways, for over two centuries, the Egyptians fought against the Hittite Empire for control of lands in modern day Syria. The conflict gave rise to a bloody boot down, such as the 1247 BC Battle of Kadesh, but by the time of the pharaoh Ramesses II, neither side had emerged as a clear victor, and this was just becoming all drawn out and bloody and just plain stupid, especially with both empires facing threats from people outside each other. But who's ever going to be the first to wave the white flag, let's be real, when it comes to two dudes, y'all are notoriously known for just beating each other up, shaking hands, and best friends again. So in 1259 BC, the two said ah to hell with it, let's do lunch, and Ramesses II and the Hittite king Hatsu Sili III negotiated a famous peace treaty, one that was either the first known in creation or one of the earliest ever. This agreement ended the conflict and decreed the two kingdoms would aid each other in the event of an invasion by a third party. This treaty is now recognized as one of the earliest surviving peace accords and a copy can be seen above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council. How about some ancient Egyptian body dysmorphia because bodies are supposed to look like this, right? That's what Akhenaten was probably wondering and it must have been awkward as hell for fine as so Queen Nefertiti and normal looking son King Tut to try and lie their way through any reply to that. Because this whack job was known for two things. Firstly, as who forced monotheism on Egypt so brutally that when he died his son had to awkwardly erase his legacy and secondly he was one funny looking dude. He had an hourglass figure like a BBL baddie, an elongated head with a square jaw jutting out, big curved almond eyes and let's say he could have filled out a bra better than me. So Egyptians like to play photoshop with their selfies the way we do now and the first depictions of Ak, his body and head are normal. But after he forced monotheism that literally destroyed the economy and empire, his gender in sculptures and carvings became became more ambiguous. Three explanations. First, he's the most hated pharaoh in history. So I mean, come on, artistic license, get some anger out. Second, perhaps his changing appearance was metaphorical, meant to portray Oct as the father and mother of all humankind. Third, is that it was a genetic disorder, such as amitrace excess syndrome, where the body released equal levels of both hormones. But we all know what the likely one was, seeing as these guys could quite literally not keep their hands or really any appendage out of their family members. I'm not gonna lie, I can't handle having eyeliner on for three hours that me and my roommate go out. Meanwhile, the pharaohs had obligatory face beat like they were working at ancient Sephora every day. Early Greek traders who visited Egypt were astonished by the sophistication and precision with which Egyptians took care of their skin and hair and decorated their bodies. Europeans remarked that almost everyone was wearing makeup even in public places and that'd be accurate as both men and women were known to wear copious amounts of the stuff believing it gave them the protection of the gods Horus and Ra who were always fighting or banging each other and doing so in a full face of makeup like some spectacular fursuit wearing drag queens. The only distinguishing factor between men and women's makeup was that men's makeup was simple while women's was often heavier and more complex. The distinguishing factor of all makeup, however, was wealth. Nobles could afford the fresher or less diluted products, while lower status had to use makeup from poorer quality materials, which sucks since they worked in the sun all day, and higher quality coal you lined your eyes with, the better it reduced sun reflection. This act will also protect them from evil spirits and eye diseases, as they believe their makeup had magical hearing powers, and they weren't entirely wrong. Research has shown that lead-based cosmetics worn along the Nile actually staved off eye infections. All right, you annoying ancient astronaut people, this is for you, Tut Space Knight. I am not sitting here doing the work for y'all, pretending we all don't know who King Tut is. He was the child pharaoh, smoked by a hippo bite, cursed tomb, blah 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 blah. So we're just going to get right to it and say he had a knife literally from space. Specifically, a small dagger, but whatever effing y'all, this thing is so sharp. To this day, the TSA would tackle you sooner than let you board anything with it. They found it in Tut's tomb in 1920s with all that other magical treasury hunky-dory that they stole out of there, and it was originally believed to be forged from the iron heart of a meteorite. Originally, ah, keyword, see, Egyptians didn't have the ability to smell. They weren't actually suitably advanced in that 
realm. So they especially wouldn't be able to forge a weapon from space metal, let alone crack open a meteorite to get to it, or know that was even an option. This has led historians to presume that the dagger was a gift from a foreign nation that did possess smelty technology. While historians are pretty confident the foreign nation wasn't the Martians, they haven't explicitly ruled that out either, so I guess those ancient alien guys might have a point. If you like stuff like this, check out our top 10 alien hieroglyphs found in ancient history video. The story of how two pharaohs throw down over pet hippos. So Pharaoh Sekinenri Teo, I'm gonna call him Sek the second, kept a pool full of pet hippopotamuses, letting his massive pet splash and play all day. Obviously, you don't get close because these are blind rage death animal machines, but this guy loved his hippos so much he could kill for them. He was willing to die for them. In fact, he literally did just that. This is back when Egypt was divided and the most powerful Egyptian kingdom was called Haikos, which was ruled by Pharaoh Apopi. Being a lesser king, Sek was required to pay tributes to Apopi out of respect. He could handle the humiliation of living under the tyranny of another man, RIP fragile male ego, but as long as Apopi didn't rub it in or act like an ass about it. So that's exactly what Apopi did. He went right for the sore spot by telling Sek to get rid of his hippos. Apparently they were too loud and Apopi couldn't sleep at night in his own house that was 750 kilometers away. Yeah, no. Sek says, hey, I can handle you bullying me constantly, but leave the hippos out of this. And he would not tolerate any further insults to his hippos. This, he declared, was grounds for war. That's what they did. Sek even died in combat, fighting for his right to a hippo pool. The war didn't end when he died, however. His son kept it going. Two generations of kings fought for a hippo pool. And in time, they won. By the end of the war, Egypt had unified once more. All because of one man's love for his hippos. And speaking of, after that unification happened, it paved the way for the royal trendsetter Narmer. Because before our boy Narmer came along, the red crown of Lower Egypt and the white crown of Upper Egypt were worn by the pre-dynastic kings. Narmer was famously the first king to be portrayed wearing both crowns symbolizing that union. This would later be replaced with the striped crown, a continuous representation of union called a nemesis. Adorning the top was the uraeus, an upright cobra that symbolized the ancient Egyptian goddess Wajet, meaning the pharaoh was ready to strike his enemies with deadly venom. Trendsetter Narmer doesn't stop at crowns, he's the first ruler to portray themselves in a royal beard, which every Egyptian pharaoh wore afterwards, whether man or woman. Then there's Narmer's implementation of an official who has the most important task of carrying the pharaoh's magic sandals. Egyptian pharaoh's sandals were the only piece of clothing that separated them from the land of Egypt and rightfully symbolized the union between the heavenly god world and the earthly human world. King Tut's sandals were famously inscribed with pictures of his enemies meaning with every step, he was crushing the enemies of Egypt. In the famous Narmer palette, he's also seen wearing a fake bull tail, which symbolized strength to rule the country of the Nile, but that trend didn't stick. Hey, so Ramses has 50 lost daughters. What a crappy dad, doesn't know where all his kids even are. Kind of understandable when you have 102 of them, with about nine women, however. Made possible by somehow living to be 91 in an age where people died at like 20. Suffice to say, he had lots of leisure time. Of course, not all the children were children at the same time. Ramses II began his family long before he took over as king, and he reigned for 66 years. He spread the brood out over most of that time. So archaeologists announced in 1820 they uncovered a tomb built by Ramses, and that 52 or so of his sons happened to be in it. They finally recently started excavations after a few decades, and now we know that the mausoleum is the largest and most complex found to date in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, with at least 62 rooms. But Egyptian kings normally didn't build mausoleums for their offsprings. Their principal wives, yes, over in the Valley of Queens, but their kids, no. If it turns out the only Ramesses sons are in the tomb, where are the 50 daughters? Sexism can answer that. Males were regarded as potential heirs to the throne, and the princesses were not, so they weren't held in high esteem and didn't get a fancy resting place. Doesn't mean they didn't have value. Ramesses designated at least three of his daughters as princess queens. Woo! No? No, oh no, what that suggests isn't pretty. But what isn't known is whether or not they were actually married to him and you know, producing, or if the title was a way of honoring selected daughters from tertiary wives. Historians, however, are pretty confident on which one it is. This would be the end of the story, but for a single question. Why would a latex protection manufacturer name its product for a man who had 102 kids? Are you choosing cats or your empire? In Egypt, the penalty for killing a cat was death. This wasn't just a law against cruelty to animals or sadistic Friday the 13th butchery. All you had to do was accidentally run over a cat with your chariot and you're done. This is mostly due to the animal being closely linked with the cat-headed goddess of warfare and balls of twine, Bastet. They were also revered for the role they played in protecting food stores and homes from disease by killing pests like snakes and rats. Basically, pharaohs coined the three laws of robotics a millennia before Asimov and used them to protect the thing that poops under the stairs. And, I, and don't think there are exceptions. One writer 
leader Dodora Siculus even recorded that the king of Egypt himself personally tried to intervene and save a Roman man who had accidentally killed a cat. His people did not give a single F, however, ignored the ruler, showed no mercy, caring literally negative a thousand if it meant risking war with Rome. They formed a mob, hung him, and left his body in the streets while the pharaoh sent a real awkward fruit basket apology to Rome. Perhaps the greatest example of a pharaoh placing the well being of cats above that of his own people, however, was Pharaoh Pismatic III literally told his army not to fight the Persians' advancement because these smart little twists had painted the image of Bastet on their shields and marched behind a line of dogs, sheep, and cats. In their words, whatever animals the Egyptians hold dear. The Egyptians, under threat of death from the pharaoh, had no choice but to let the Persian ruler walk straight into the city unchecked. He then murked anyone who dared to challenge him, using the shields with cats drawn on them because you can't even strike an image of a cat in ancient Egypt. Cambyses, the ruler's name, celebrated in a dignified noble fashion, marching the Egyptian armies past him as he threw cats at them and screamed insults at their gods. We aren't 100% sure who the first pharaoh was, but it was probably Catfish Chisel. The only way we know the lineage for early Egyptian kinship is the highly damaged Palermo Stone, which was a black slab of granite carved full of the names of kings up to the 5th dynasty. The part of the stone where the first and second king of the 1st dynasty is inscribed is butts to clean off. Although it is generally accepted that the first king was Narmer, aka Menes. The second one was Aha. Even without enough evidence to prove beyond a doubt, I can't get past the Aha thing. The name of Narmer is composed to two ideograms. The catfish reading as Nar and the chisel reading as Mer. The location of Narmer's body has eluded archaeologists for two centuries now. The first Egyptian pharaohs used to build a type of tomb called a Mabasta and they did so until the third dynasty when they started busting out pyramids. It's theorized Narmer is in one of those. But then Egyptologists have discovered a large field of pre-dynastic and early dynastic royal tombs in Umm al-Kab and the Narmer's name is identified in an inscription found. However, this is Egypt. The site had suffered disturbances, tomb robbing, and disrest for the past 5,000 years, making it impossible to know which one of the bodies is the precise tomb of Narmer. To this day, archaeologists and Egyptologists disagree on whether Narmer was buried in Saqqara or Umm al-Kab and in the end, his cause of death isn't even fully known. Just that of a philosopher in Mantheo saying the reign of Narmer ends when he was carried off by a hippopotamus and perished. And last but not least, believe my eyes, even though it may be a lie. Who knows, I don't, but I love a good rhyme. While it was likely a disease genetically inherited in its DNA, the official Egyptian story is that Pharaohs was cursed by the gods with blindness. Apparently, when the Nile was flooding, Pharaohs got fed up with it, and instead of letting the water do its thing and calm down, he chucked a spear at it. Because yes, throwing a spear at a river would probably change things. For his insolence and stupidity, the gods struck his ass Pharaoh's vibes this way the best he can for 10 years before he meets an oracle that either wanted to pull history's most hilariously mean prank or genuinely believed the gods had passed on this message. But the oracle tells Pharaoh all he's got to do is wash his eyes with the urine of a woman who's never slept with any other person than her husband her whole life. Okay. Well, Pharaoh isn't asking questions. He's here for solutions. He finds his wife and says, babe, I want to spice things up in the bedroom. I have an idea. And the two of them give it a try. Only it doesn't work. So now he's still blind and his wife has some explaining to do. Before she does that though, Pharaoh needs some more urine and he needed it now. So every woman in town is gathered up and given a pot, which he then sat there dumping its contents into his eyes one after each other. No, I don't know if he waited for it to cool down. I do know it was probably the color of French's mustard though, seeing as Egyptians literally only drank warm beer. So imagine. But somehow Pharaoh finds the one who's not cheating on her husband or hadn't banged someone before getting married and one of these warm beer pee buckets works. And I wish I was kidding, but the official Egyptian records say yeah, magic pee did this. His sight is back and he asks for the hand of the magic pee wielding woman so they can marry on the spot. All the while her husband awkwardly watches the consequences of his wife not cheating on him unfold. Oh, and then Pharaoh burned his old wife to death. Or at least that's how the legend goes. I highly doubt that it really did restore his eyes and maybe he just ordered historians to write a good story to explain a weird habit. You know, <laughs> fetish. We got a <laughs> fetish here. Sammy <laughs> Lacker. <Lacker's here. laughs> Number 10, Hathor. The goddess Hathor was originally created by her dad, Ra, as a destroyer of men. She was supposed to punish all those who were disobedient to him. But then Ra was like, meh. I don't really like that idea. He just kind of changed his mind and decided to make her the exact opposite. Instead, the goddess of love. But she kind of loved killing men and like even he couldn't stop her. So one night he gave her what was supposed to be a mug of ale, but actually made it like a special kind of blood and she got so drunk off of it that she got too tired out to kill anymore and therefore became the goddess of love. 
<laughs> Drunk in love, am I right? Her cult was centered in Dendera, where she was also seen as the goddess of fertility and childbirth. When the Greeks occupied Egypt, they compared her with the goddess Aphrodite. But unlike the voluptuous woman Aphrodite was depicted as, Hathor came in three forms, and I bet you can't guess which. She was depicted as either a woman with a cow's ears, wearing the headdress of a cow, or just a cow. Moo. <laughs> Number nine, the beginning of the world. I yeah, what a what an inventive way to imagine the beginning of things. I mean, the Big Bang is still pretty crazy too. But hey, here we go. Freaking love how much magic is in these stories. Like I'm in because that's all there was at the beginning of the universe, according to the ancient Egyptians. Just swirling darkness, chaos, and magic. Heka, the god of magic, was the only thing that existed, waiting for the opportune moment to begin. Then a hill showed up called Ben Ben, and out of which the god Atum erupted from. He was lonely, so he mated with his own shadow to give birth to two children, Shu and Tefnut. Shu gave life, Tefnut gave order. They left their father to build the world, but they were gone so long he took out his eye and sent it to search for them. In the meantime, he just kind of sat there contemplating eternity all alone. It was really sad. This guy sounds like Zeus mixed with Eeyore. Anyways, his kids came back and he was so happy he wept tears of joy and out of which were born men and women. They also brought his eye back, so that was nice. Number eight, light as a feather. So unlike a lot of religions we've heard of, there wasn't really a concept of hell in Egyptian mythology. It was either you were worthy of heading into the afterlife or you weren't. Mat was the goddess of harmony and supported the belief that if harmony was disrupted, it must be restored. Every ancient Egyptian myth in some form follows this format. But the most important role she played was in the afterlife. When the soul left the body, it would appear in the hall of truth in order to stand judgment before Osiris. The heart would be weighed on a golden scale against Mat white feather. If the heart was heavier, it would be devoured by a monster and the soul would disappear. If it was lighter, then you could go live in eternal bliss. So instead of several layers of burning torment, souls in Egypt instead faced eternal darkness and unconsciousness. The idea of non-existence was more terrifying than being cut up by demons. Huh. Number seven, Osiris and Isis. Okay, so we aren't strangers to deities being a fan of incest. It was kind of like, how they multiplied and ancient Greeks were okay with it, kind of, but they kind of weren't. Anyways, the Egyptian gods were no exception. Isis and Osiris were two of the four children of the goddess of Nut. Isis and Osiris were married and actually really in love. They, they, they dug each other. When Osiris rose to the throne as the eldest sibling, his brother Set was pretty jealous. So he took the life of his own brother, cut him into little pieces, and scattered them all over Egypt. He really wanted to make sure the guy was dead. But then Isis wasn't someone you wanted to mess with. She had great magical powers capable of restoring life. She collected all of the pieces of her brother slash husband and breathed life back into him. Osiris returned to life and they made all the love and then soon conceived a child named Horus. However, Osiris couldn't return to the land of the living, so he had to stay and rule over the underworld. So his son Horus was left to get revenge, and we'll get to that later. Number six, Anubis. Now, I think in West Western films that depict ancient Egypt, like The Mummy Returns, the god Anubis is often associated with the underworld. You know, that creepy half man, half jackal creature who appears to walk out of your nightmares? He's so creepy. Well, he did used to run the underworld until Osiris took over, but he was actually the god of mummification and the afterlife. So not wrong, but not the whole story. Anubis was the son of Nephthys and Set. Well. Kind of. Nephthys actually never conceived the child with Set. She kind of had a she kind of had the hots for Osiris. So she disguised herself as Isis and made love to him that way, and then Anubis came to life. That may have been one of the reasons Seth attacked Osiris in the first place as his suspicions rose. But it was actually Anubis who helped Isis piece together Osiris, creating the first mummy. Fun fact, during the Greek rule of Egypt, Anubis and Hermes were seen kind of as the same. The people who ferried the dead to the underworld. Oh, sorry, and a point. Anubis was actually the one who weighed people's hearts, so he used the feather. The thing, you know what to do. He was responsible for doing that. Number five, Horus and Set. Speaking of Horus, earlier, remember how I said Horus had to take over defending his father? Well, here is where this story begins. When Horus grew up to be a man, he pulled a Hamlet. He was like, You killed my father, prepare to die. Thus, a series of battles ensued, and one of the gods didn't play fair. 
Set kept cheating at everything and continued to come out as victor. Not surprising since he didn't earn his way on the throne, he killed for it, kind of like a certain Claudius. Eventually Isis stepped up to help her son slash nephew overcome her brother. She set a trap for Set, but after some pitiless begging for his own life, she let him go. Horus was pissed, so angry some of the other gods got upset that he was so angry. They agreed to compete in a final boat race and Horus was like crushing it. He was doing really well, he was about to win. But then of course, Set cheated by turning into a hippopotamus and attacked the boat. Therefore claiming victory once again. Osiris finally showed up and declared that no man should take the throne through murder. So Horus took the throne. Why Osiris didn't just settle the whole deal from the beginning is confusing in itself. But hey, kind of reminded me of the eagles that showed at the end of Lord of the Rings that could have saved like three movies. You know? Kind of like that. Anyways, let's move on. Number four, Ra and his boat. Ra is one of the most revered gods in Egyptian mythology, especially since he was the god of the sun. He was depicted as a man with the head of a falcon. That kind of makes sense. He was once the greatest of all gods, but had to take a step back after he got too old and tired, and especially considering his task, I can see why. His job was to drive away darkness and sail across the skies, delivering light wherever he went. But at night, he would dive into the underworld and have to cross 12 gates. 12 hours, an hour per gate. After paying his respect to Osiris every night, a giant snake named Apophis tried to attack and swallow the boat. Every night! Poor guy, no wonder he got worn out. Every day it got harder to defend, and even one night, Apophis succeeded, but could only hold the sunlight for so long. She threw it up, which explained solar eclipses. After Set was cast out after the whole nephew battle, he ended up serving Ra in his boat and kept the snake at bay. But there's something confusing coming later that I think you'll agree is very confusing. So here we go. Coming up next, we have Bast, number three. Have you ever had a cat look you up and down and kind of like expect something? Like worship, you know? Are you a cat person, dog person? Let me know in the comments. Well, that's because cats were a big deal in Egyptian mythology. They even had their own goddess. Bastet was a cat goddess depicted as a woman with a cat's head. Cats had a meaningful role in ancient Egypt as they protected their food from rats and snakes. They were even seen as family members and to harm one was punishable by death. Legend says that sometimes cats would enter burning buildings to save their families. If they died, the goddess would bring them back to life, hence the idea of cats having nine lives. There it is. Now here's where things get confusing. You know that story I told about Ra? Well apparently Bastet was in the boat with him as well. During the day she would ride with him, and at night she would turn into a cat and then defend the boat from Apophis the snake. But I thought that was set. So many conflicting things. I saw like a couple different stories who said, each thing was different, so who knows. Number two, Jeb and Nut. Yet another sibling partnership, we have Jeb and Nut. They fell deeply in love and could never be separated. They were that couple who would like constantly be like, oh my god, stop, right next to each other at dinner, you know what I mean? Jeb was the god of the earth and Nut was the god of the sky. A previously mentioned god, Atum, found their union inappropriate, so he pushed Nut into the sky far away from Jeb. He just didn't like being a third wheel. Jeb and Nut were close enough to see each other but can never hold each other again. And she gave birth to Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Some say Horus too, but I don't think that's true. Number one, the treasure thief. Okay, I don't know how I feel about this story, okay? This doesn't really feel like harmony is in balance, but anyways. The treasure thief ends in a way I really didn't expect and I'm not sure you will either. Long ago, a great pharaoh with a wealth of riches decided to build a pyramid in which to keep them safe. One of the builders was wise to his plan and decided to find a way to claim them for himself. He built a stone vault with a hidden entrance covered by a slab so he could get to the riches. But unfortunately, he fell ill before he could return, so he told his sons of his plan. The sons headed to the pyramid in the dead of night, following their father's order. But unbeknownst to them, the pharaoh had laid booby traps and one brother was caught in one. Not wanting to be found or interrogated, revealing his other brother, he told his brother to chop his head off. Ugh, that he did. Loyalty? I don't know. The pharaoh upon finding the body hung it up in the town square in the hopes of like weeding out whoever it belonged to. But the other brother being so clever got the guards drunk and stole back his brother's body in the dead of night. The pharaoh was like, I'm not even mad. I'm just impressed. He gave the thief a pardon, summoned him to the square and gave his daughter to marry him. Yeah, dude, you tried to steal my jewels? Don't worry about it. Have my daughter, because you're so talented at your job. 
Great work. Kicking off our list at number 10, the Dendera Light. Here we go. Going back to ancient aliens, maybe, who knows. The Dendera Light is a controversial image found in the Temple of Hathor in Dendera, Egypt. Now, some theories suggest that this image here depicts an ancient Egyptian light bulb or some advanced electrical technology of some sorts, which is pretty exciting. However, mainstream Egyptologists interpret it as a symbolic representation of religious concepts. That makes more sense than ancient Egyptian light brights, I guess. I guess Yes, it's not as fun, but sure, it checks out. The bulb is more likely a depiction of the lotus flower, and the central figure holding a snake is associated with the creation myths. So, yeah, there's some history there. There's some tea behind. There's some stuff you have to know. The Dendera light is a subject of debate and speculation to this day, of course, because people want to believe that this is aliens, an alien light show. But there's currently no concrete evidence to support the claim that this represents ancient Egyptian knowledge of electricity or advanced lighting technology of sorts. Again, part of me wants to believe even ancient light bulbs, but maybe I've been playing too much Zelda. It's probably it. It's probably that, maybe. I don't know. Number nine, beer. Yeah, that's some pretty good stuff coming up next. Ancient Egyptians, they brewed and consumed beer on a daily basis. Now, they considered it a staple of their diet. Cool, me too, I guess. Beer production was primarily a household activity with everybody in the family helping the process, which is great. That's, what does your family taste like? Let's do it. The brewing techniques here involved fermenting grains, barley, and flavoring the beer with dates, honey, and spices, and pretty much anything you wanted. It's your brew. Get creative, throw, throw random shit in there. See how it tastes. Why not? It's ancient Egypt. Beer had both religious and social significance. Beer would be offered to deities and consumed during festivals and gatherings. Give a, a deity a Coors Light, you're like, here you go. This ought to cool you down. Rocky Mountain certified, buddy. Stop yelling, stop cursing our lands. It also provided hydration, nutrition, and a means of socializing in ancient Egyptian society. So, hard to say no to that. Twist my arm, please. Number eight, curses. Of course, these are, these are real. These are very real. And you'll get cursed if you don't hit that thumbs up. Ancient Egyptian curses are a subject of fascination and speculation, of course. Curses were believed to be supernatural powers wielded by priests or individuals to protect sacred sites and or tombs from desecration. These curses often warned of dire consequences for anyone who disturbed the resting place of a pharaoh or violated these sacred spaces at all. The curses were typically inscribed on tomb walls or objects and invoked the wrath of gods and spirits. Ergo, don't touch my sh Thanks. Many inscriptions contain symbolic threats rather than the direct supernatural actions. So the curse of the pharaohs is mainly associated with King Tut. This curse gained attention when several individuals involved in the excavation of Tut's tomb just died unexpectedly. However, these deaths can be attributed to natural causes or coincidences, of course. But the timing here was a little, it's a little cursed. Nobody really knows, right? We want to believe. Maybe it's fun to believe. That way we won't steal things from the dead, right? Let's go that way. Number seven, a pet hippo. Are you a dog person? Are you a cat person? How about hippos? They're fun. They'll maybe eat you. Who knows? Real quick, do you have any idea how fast hippos are? I had no clue my entire life. I thought they were fat and fun and stationary. No, hippos can run as fast as 50 kilometers an hour. Their bite is three times as powerful as the bite of a lion's. Yeah, so you shouldn't fuck with them. You shouldn't fuck with them with a the pH. <laughs> the pharaoh Menes was Egypt's first pharaoh. We refer to him as the lost pharaoh because, well, for starters, he was alive a very long time ago, 3000 BC, don't know much about him, but also he was killed by his pet hippo, therefore definitely lost. We lost him fast, fast and loud. This king spent over 60 years on the throne, and after all of that, all the wars and conquests and all the treaties, after all that, a hippo got him. What a shame. I mean, to be fair, I don't think there's a harder way to go out as a king. A hippo kills you? I don't know. That's pretty badass. That's like top three coolest ways to die next to like the Megalodon. I don't know. Number six, Israel Sphinx Claws. Ah, here we go. Some ancient Wolverine stuff coming in here. The mystery of the Sphinx Claws in Israel. This refers to a set of large limestone claws that were of course discovered near the city of Tel Hazor. Now these claws resemble feline paws of some sort. They're very sharp, very large, very intimidating, and they're believed to have once been part of a Sphinx sculpture. So if someone just took a little bit home with them, that's always nice. The origin and purpose of these claws of course remain uncertain. Now some theories suggest that they were brought from Egypt or represent the influence of Egyptian culture in the region. One of the two. Someone stole it or someone was inspired. One of the two. Others propose alternative explanations such as symbolic or decorative elements. However, without further evidence or historical context, we don't really know because this was, I don't know, 3,000 years ago? Where did these hands come from? They're scary, but we'll never know. It is fascinating. I just wanted to show you these cool hands. Number five. 
fake beard. I need one of these, cause uh, yeah, I tried recently and it disappeared off the channel. I was too, I was too ashamed to come back. Long before Cleopatra, Hepshaput was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. This is pretty impressive. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male, as a male pharaoh. So the pharaoh fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was done as an act of politics. Now after her passing come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name. He, yeah, just scripted, back then it wasn't, you know, hard to just, you break one thing and then everything's gone. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this idiot being like, hey, fake beards, look at that, you missed one. Number four, game night. I love board games, even Monopoly, believe it or not. I have the patience for it every now and then. But ancient Egyptians, they also fancied a board game, turns out, who knew? Dogs and Jackals, Mahen, Senate, and 20 Squares. These were all popular go-to games for their ancient Egyptian cottage weekends. Mahen was played around 2500 BC, and the goal was to reach the center of the spiral first. The board was a coiled snake almost. It was quite beautiful. Senate was the most popular game. Queens and kings alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now, of course, the rules are still unknown and heavily debated, just like Monopoly. But you had three rows of 10 squares. The last five squares are decorated. So it's assumed that this game was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these game boards. There's something very Jumanji about this that I want to know more of, but I also don't want to know more of. Why was he buried with a board game? That's kind of terrifying. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing a board game of sorts. Yeah, it kind of looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. My palms would be so sweaty. I'd be like, checkmate, please don't exile me. Thanks so much, let's play again sometime, peace. Number three. The first peace treaty. Bizarre at the time? Absolutely, definitely, this is a first. The first peace treaty in history was back in 1271 BC. Now at this point in time, Egyptians and the Hittite Empire, they were fighting over modern day Syria. Now this conflict had been lasting centuries and come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. At this point, there's tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight, so what's left to do at this point? A peace treaty, right? Hopefully, ideally, Ramses II and King Hattusili III both negotiated negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if a third party decided to now get involved. A copy of the treaty can be found in New York right above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. Pretty impressive. I have a license plate above my room, so that's almost as cool, I guess. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty, so that's how you know it's official. Guinness confirms it. Moving on. Number two, renewed passport. Now I'm thinking about where my passport is and I'm immediately panicking. I'm like, oh, which shelf? Ooh. Before our big bad haunting number one, we'll do a fun one with some recent history. This is cheeky. Passports are important and they're a pain to replace. But did you know that you can still get one even if you've been dead for thousands of years? Well, now you do. You just have to be a pharaoh though. That's the only rule. You have to be a pharaoh or some sort of king. Pharaoh Ramses II, we just talked about him, one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers. He got a passport back in 1974. Insane, the same time my grandma did probably. After being exhumed and put on display for so long, it was decided that it's now time to send this lost king off to Paris to get touched up. Now, obviously you're not gonna list this Pharaoh king as luggage, that would be super disrespectful. So the Egyptian government gave Ramses II his own official Egyptian passport for his commute with a photo. Just in case you didn't know. On the passport, he had his info. It's all great. He has age, very old, occupation, a king. And in case it wasn't obvious, it was stated that the king was deceased. Looking at him, you're like, oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, go on in. Definitely dead. For sure dead. Don't even have to look twice. We're good. And finally, number one, trusty servant. In ancient Egypt, it was common for servants to accompany their masters into the afterlife. Whenever they go, now you have to go. Horrible, right? This practice reflected the belief that individuals needed assistance and companionship even in the realm of the dead. Hashtag needy. Servants were considered essential for ensuring the comfort and well-being of the deceased here and again in the afterlife, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but again, long time ago, different beliefs. They would be depicted in tomb paintings and inscriptions, and their statues or figurines would be placed in these tombs to then serve the deceased. These servants were believed to continue their duties in the afterlife, providing sustenance, performing daily tasks, and maintaining the deceased social status. Like, when does it end, guy? Like, f come on. The inclusion the inclusion of servants and burial rituals exemplifies the importance of social hierarchy and the idea of continuity in ancient Egyptian culture. So while it's crazy to us, it's, well, it's very important then. 
It's quite important now. Fucking crazy, but it's still pretty important. Legal bet. The best example of this is one way ticket. If you've watched some of our other Pharaoh videos before, you may know the reason their tombs are so packed full of art and treasure, but also carriages and beds and forks and snacks. Genuinely just random living equipment is because the Egyptians ran on the belief that after death, you continued to live life. So you need all the stuff that you had in your regular life if you wanted to maintain your comfort and not have to rebuy or rebuild everything. So, if you're an everyday person, yeah, they may toss your toothbrush and your teddy bear in there, but pharaohs were used to a more personal, larger commodity. People, servants and concubines and serfs, so all of these people were considered possessions as well. So, if the pharaoh died for a super long time, they'd quite literally mass kill his whole staff and toss him down there in his tomb. For example, one of the very first rulers, King Aha, supposedly died after being gored to death by a hippo. To accompany Aha to the afterlife, some Courtiers, retainers, and slaves downed poison and were buried with him. Sometimes, if the rumor is true, these peoples would also simply be sealed into the tombs alive. Fights to say crime, very big crime, very big crime, 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 crime. While that wasn't a big deal then, however, the Trishrata agreement violations was. Trishrata, the king of Mitadani, who was another close ally of Egypt's, had given his daughter's hand in marriage to Akinsaten, the father of Amenhotep, aka King Tut. Upon his father, father's death, the young pharaoh married the Mitatani princess as well, making her one of the lesser wives. Let's be real, Nefertiti had homeboy's heart, soul, and boys in a chokehold. Toshada sent Akhenaten many letters to protest the fact that he'd never received the agreed upon bride price of solid gold statues and instead had only been sent gold plated wooden ones. Cheapos. The pharaohs didn't avoid all diplomatic matters, just the ones they didn't personally entrust him. His attention was primarily focused on religious reform and life within his palace. This Persian pharaoh was a known prick and animal hater. The Persian son of Cyrus the Great, after Cambius' nation conquered Egypt though, he was put in charge of that country. And so he was the ruler of Egypt and, apparently, someone who hated animals. This is the psycho who strapped cats onto shields to gain entry into Egypt, put on fights between lion cubs and puppies, and once killed the sacred apis bull, a literal crime in ancient Egypt punishable by death. When Cambyses returned to Memphis after after an unsuccessful military campaign in the south, Apis' new reincarnation happened to appear in Egypt the same day, which is a massive call of celebration. When Apis appears, the Egyptians all at once don their best clothes and they hold a festival. Seeing this, Cambyses is convinced they're celebrating his misfortunes, so he summoned the rulers of Memphis and demanded to know why the Egyptians were behaving this way. They answered that a god had appeared and it was custom for Egyptians to rejoice that occasion? Cambyses is unconvinced though and claims they're lying and has them put to death. He then next summons the priest, who told him the same thing when he asked. He replied that if a tame god had come to Egypt, he would know about it. Then he ordered the priests bring Apis before him, which they stupidly do. When the priests lead him in, Cambius draws his dagger and stabs the bull. Laughing at their screams of horror, he said to the priest, are these your gods, fools of flesh and blood who can feel the bite of iron? This is a fitting god for Egyptians, but I will teach you to make a laughing stock of me. He then ordered all the priests swift and any other Egyptians celebrating to be killed. So the festival ended and the priests were punished and Apis lay in the temple until it died and they had to secretly bury it. This was arguably kinda a crime, kinda not. It's Cleopatra, sibling annihilator. And she is nowhere near the only one. Egyptian pharaohs loved to smoke their own siblings, kids, nephews, to, to ensure any kind of throne claim. That's why, yeah, it was a crime, but who's gonna do something about that and what can you do that won't make you the next coup victim yourself? Power grabs and murder plots were as much a Ptolematic tradition as inter-sibling marriage, and Cleopatra and her brothers and sisters were no different. Her first sibling husband, Ptolemy the Bajillions ran her out of Egypt after she tried to take sole possession of the throne. And then the pair later faced off in a civil war that she won by shacking up with Uncle Caesar. Ptolemy then drowned in the Nile. Following the war, Cleopatra married her younger brother, and she is believed to have killed him not long after, as the marriage was just to ensure her and Caesar's son, Caesarian, was next in line. In 41 BC, she also engineered the death of her sister, Aronso, who was considered a rival to the throne. See, so yeah, I'd say a bunch of 
killing coups. That's a crime. <laughs> Nothing like a klepto gaslighter king, though. Amasis's crime was literally being a petty thief. Absolutely zero yard cred for that one. Dude was a raging alcoholic, nympho, and made it to the throne by being sent to calm down a rebellion, but instead chose to join it and lead it, overthrowing the pharaoh and earning him his throne. Ever a master of tact, he sent the king his declaration of war by actually lifting his leg and farting and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He's that guy. But what was most hilarious, at least to me, was the fact he's a kleptomaniac that would steal his friend's stuff, then put it in his house, invite those friends over, intentionally bring them to the room where the item was, and then try to convince them that they'd never owned it in the first place once they'd seen it. This is the single most frat boy personality I've come across in ancient times anywhere, and it's glad to know that it actually does come from somewhere. By making religion illegal, he was defying the laws of the gods, Akhenaten's monotheism. Intentionally erased from history until the 19th century, Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten established the first known monotheistic religion called Atanism, which was rediscovered in the late 18th century and integrated by the 19th and 20th centuries religion philosophers into the histories of the three Abrahamic religions. During Akhenaten's first years as pharaoh, he did recognize the existence of other gods, even though Aten was his primary patron deity. There exists iconography from early Akhenaten's reign, where he was still Amenhotun of Aten, and that includes images of the other solar gods. However, those scenes of Aten sharing space with other gods soon disappear in later depictions, and some of these iconographs of Aten, alongside other deities, are defaced a few years later after their creation. Additionally, any mention of Akhenaten's old name, Amenhotun, was also hacked out. Akhenaten would eventually officially proclaim that Aten was the one and only god, and he condemned the worship and or acknowledgement of any other deity, going so as far as to remove their names and effigies. This actually led to Ak's condemnation of memory, a practice reserved for scrubbing unlikable people from history. By imposing these laws, he defied the universe's laws and those unspoken of freedom of religion in them. Womp womp, y'all ain't gonna like this one. It's Puppy Mills. Very legal, as they should should be. Your reminder to please go to the SPCA and a charity and adopt one of those adult animals or rescued baby animals rather than financially feed a puppy or kitten male because you want a fancy breed. But back in ancient Egypt, they were not only incredibly necessary, but also, well, come a dog. Is it okay to use that right now? In Saqqara, researchers have discovered burial sites filled with a huge number of mummified animals, nearly 8 million of them, and most of them are dogs. The catacomb in particular is one dedicated to the jackal-headed god Anubis, who represents the afterlife. Archaeologist and Egyptologist Salma Ikram writes that the animal mummification began in ancient Egypt to allow beloved pets to go on to the afterlife as well, to provide food in the afterlife, and to act as offerings to a particular god. Nowadays people go to church and they light a candle when they wanted some godly handouts, but the Egyptians were in for the long haul. One little flame isn't enough, so instead they would offer a mummified dog. To get a mummified dog, well, Ikram says the huge number of mummified dogs implies, if not completely confirms, the existence of ancient Egyptian puppy mills. As quote, you don't get 8 million mummies without having puppy farms, and some of these dogs were killed deliberately so that they could be offered. So for us, that really seems heartless, but for the Egyptians, they felt that the dogs were going straight up to join the eternal pack with Anubis, and so they were going off to a better thing. 2,000 years later, Alex is facing his crimes. During his stay in Egypt, Alexander the Great was proclaimed the new pharaoh. He received historic titles associated with the position, such as the son of Ra and beloved of Amun. Whether Alexander also received the elaborate coronation ceremony at Memphis, however, is debated. But what won't be is him being on this list. Fight me all. Although he was in control of Persia by 330 BC, a very drunk and very angry, he stood stripped royal treasuries as he went through the country and captured Persia's capital, Persepolis, burning it to the ground in a final act of revenge against Persia with all the treasures inside. Alexander the Great's Macedonian army then pillaged the city, destroyed the palace complex, killed almost every single civilian, and then violated and stole the women. So, 2,377 years later, on the 26th of October 2022, Alexander the Great stood trial for war crimes at the UK Supreme Court. He was charged with four count of violation of laws and customs of war during the raising and conquest of Persepolis. The prosecution argued that Alexander was a war criminal who committed atrocities at Persepolis as a deliberate political act. The defense argued that the burning of Persepolis was not politically motivated, rather it was merely a tragic consequence of his drunken behavior. And shockingly, the jury acquitted him on all four counts of war crimes. 
The verdict surprised Lord Legat, the Supreme Court justice presiding, after the jury chose to judge the defendant by the standards of his own time rather than the modern customs of war and the annual classics for all moot trial. I cannot help but feel some regret that you found deliberate extermination and enslavement not to be war crimes, but so be it, Legat said. Now for something that was a Grecian no, but in Egypt it's a yeah, sibling relations. So it, the Egyptian pharaohs wouldn't be breaking any crimes, but with the Polytamic dynasty when they came in, they were Macedonian Greeks from a land where it was very much a crime to be doing some stuff with your siblings. It's also very much a crime by today's standards everywhere but Alabama. So The Ptolemies adopted this practice from the Egyptians whom they'd conquered, although this would ironically exclude the native Egyptians. The tradition of sibling marriages appears to have begun with Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who married his older sister Arsenio II. The epithet Philadelphus actually means sibling lover, but they kept it clean. It wasn't until the union of Ptolemy III and Arsenio III that this custom of interfamily marriage resulted in the first birth of an heir. All earlier heirs to the Egyptian throne in the Ptolemaic dynasty had been from the side wives. As noted by historian Sheila L. Agar, the Greeks clearly believed that interfamily relations were repugnant not only to the gods, but to all right-thinking individuals. Given that the Greek literature sees it as one of the greatest taboos, things did not turn out well for Oedipus after all. There has been a protracted scholarly debate as to why the Ptolemies engaged in it. One of the primary explanations is they were influenced by the local culture. However, the practice of sibling marriage may have also bolstered their legitimacy as authentic pharaohs in the eyes of their Egyptian subjects. Despite this, even though other Greek families had moved to Egypt were also marrying cousins, there is a tendency to blame the Egyptians for the Ptolematic you know, issue. Now, it, the insane way in which Cleo learned the toxic limits. Alexandria became a prestigious center of learning and the first medical center of the ancient world. As the last member of the Ptolemaic dynasty, Cleopatra inherited the throne, but also the great inclination of the Ptolemies towards medicine and science. Attracted by knowledge of venoms and poison, Cleopatra began to test them on condemned prisoners to see the different reactions produced in the body and found toxic limitations. By tricking or directly for Forcing the prisoners into testing these poisons and mixes, Cleo learned oral poisons would cause disturbances such as painful spasms, nausea, abdominal cramps, and slow ends. She even had set snakes on prisoners in order to compare the major effects of venomous snake bites caused by the various species in Egypt such as vipers or elephants. It has been said that Cleopatra used the cobra to take her own life because it would also make sense in some Egyptian mythology being associated with the sacred uraeus worn by the pharaohs. How However, there are several problems with this theory and some scholars argue when she decided to take her life using the information from testing these poisons, she would use a poison that would make sense that given the possibility to choose the best one to have a quick and relatively pain free death. Number 10. Construction. We can't talk about ancient Egypt and the mysteries still unsolved there if we don't start on how the hell these things were built. And also, it's not just like three pyramids. There's 118 of these things. When did they have time to construct all of these? Ropes? Pulley systems? Yeah, I'm not convinced. Ramps? Ramps. Ramps would have been a mile long against the pyramid's height. That's like hundreds of years right there. You ever dug a hole in your backyard? Two feet. It's like six hours right there. And a sore back. Some have theorized a water hydraulic system was used to transport the carved rocks up slopes and tubes with tidal power. Okay, better, better. But like, how did they line up the rocks so perfectly and so square at the top? One inch off and every carpenter knows that's gonna shift everything. Also, the alignment to true north, the odd coincidences with the dimensions resembling the cosmos, they couldn't have known back then, you know? Buckle up, it's only gonna get weirder. Number nine, Chamber of Secrets. In 2017, scientists were able to peek inside the Great Pyramid finally using modern day physics. Particles, actually. What they found revealed numerous hidden secret chambers and rooms that were thought to never exist. The most bizarre discoveries was a massive unknown void nearly 100 feet long that lays just above the pyramid's grand gallery. Khufu, also known as the Great Pyramid, was received the most attention due to its size and age, but it wasn't the only chamber they found. No. Gold, mummies, manuscripts, ancient technology. What lies inside these voids? Also, how the hell did they floor and roof a room that's unaccessible? How do you build that inside such a small chamber already? Muon tomography uses cosmic rays of muons and generates a 3D image through nearly any material. This technology is groundbreaking. Literally. Uh, yeah, yep, found it. There it is. 
Number 8. The Saqqar Temple The Pyramid of Djoser, also known as the Steppe Pyramid, is an archaeological site in the Saqqara necropolis. The discovery of a 4,400 year old tomb now seen as UNESCO's World Heritage Site is the 6th tier four-sided structure which very well may be the earliest colossal stone structure in Egypt and possibly the world. Stone mounds were made in Europe for millennia but it was the pyramid shape that started here. It was built 27th century BC during the third dynasty for the pharaoh Djoser. The pyramid is the center of a huge complex and an enormous courtyard surrounded by ceremonial structures and decorations. Its architect was created from THE Egyptian architect himself, Imhotep, the high priest of the god Ra. This guy was like the building manager you know, the head architect. In fact, wasn't even found or really even studied till about the 1920s and was recently excavated in 2018. The pyramid went through several revisions over the years and in March 2020, the pyramid was officially reopened for visitors after a 14 year fix up. Check out Netflix, they do a great documentary on this. Number 7. Queen Nefertiti, the queen of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, the beloved royal wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten. Nefertiti and her husband were known for a religious revolution in which they worshipped solely the sun disk Aten as their one and only god. Oh, blasphemy! She reigned during what was arguably the wealthiest and most lavish period of, of ancient Egypt. Here's the weird part. We don't know where she is. Usually kings and queens are buried in very spiritual, very high ranked places like the royal tomb. Easy to find. But nope, no one can find her or even know what happened to her. In 2015, archaeologists thought with high resolution scans, voids that are behind the walls of Tutankhamun's tomb proposed maybe that she was there. Nope, no Nefertiti. In 2003, archaeologists thought through the hair DNA, Nefertiti's mummy may have been quote, the younger lady. Nope. Turns out it was just Tutankhamun's mom. So what exactly happened to this famously revered queen? Who knows? Aliens, dude. When in doubt, always aliens. You know what I mean? Number six, King Tut's death. When archaeologists opened a sarcophagus in Egypt's Valley of the Kings for the first time in 1923, it was the discovery of a lifetime. The ancient Egyptian boy king, King Tutankhamun, the burial chamber of the 19 year old who ruled 3,300 years ago. But why did he die so young? DNA tests and CT scans show he suffered from malaria, a broken leg, and congenital deformities associated with inbreeding, common amongst royalty. Ouch. Because of his tomb's extremely small size, historians think King Tut's death must have been unexpected and his burial rushed by A, who succeeded him as a pharaoh. The tomb's chambers were packed to the brim with more than 5,000 artifacts including furniture, chariots, clothes, weapons, and 130 of the king's walking sticks. A 24 pound solid gold mask was placed over him and he was laid in a series of containers, three golden coffins, and a granite sarcophagus. His death still has scientists scratching their heads. Also, look up how many archaeologists died months after the cursed tomb had been raided. Yeah, you don't want to know. Number five, the lost labyrinth. Archaeologists uncovered what's believed to be the remains of a long lost labyrinth below the sand of the pyramid of Hawara, known as quote, the labyrinth. Built by Amenhet III, it was the most visited sites of the ancient world. Greek Herodotus claimed to have counted 3,000 rooms in the pyramid's funeral complex during the 5th century BC. According to them, the underground temple consists of over 3,000 rooms filled with remarkable hieroglyphics and paintings. Close, too. Located less than 100 kilometers from Cairo. In 2008, with the aid of ground penetrating technology, a Belgian Egyptian expedition was able to confirm the presence of an enormous underground temple. With with no visible remains, the story was thought to be a legend passed down until Egyptologists uncovered its foundations in the 1800s. The results of this expedition indicate the presence of grid-like structures deep beneath the sand. Please tell me there's no minotaur just running around down there. Okay. Number four, the mystery queen. Archaeologists have unearthed a tomb of a previously unknown queen believed to have been the wife of Pharaoh Neferefra, who ruled 4,500 years ago. The tomb was discovered in Abu Sur, an old kingdom necropolis southwest of Cairo, where there are several pyramids dedicated to the pharaohs of the fifth dynasty. The name of his wife had not been known until recently. She was Kenta Kaz, renowned as the mother of two Egyptian pharaohs. Kenta Kaz I is a mysterious woman who ruled in the fourth dynasty dynasty and has archaeologists puzzled at her burial complex in Giza. Though rough evidence for ancient Egyptian queens, the remains of this female leader were undisturbed for two millennia within the necropolis until its excavation in the late 1930s. Hieroglyphic inscriptions concerning her title had been discovered and subsequently became open for interpretation. Her title was initially regarded to be quote, king of upper and lower Egypt and quote, 
mother of king of Upper and Lower Egypt. So who was this mysterious, powerful figure in ancient Egypt? Who was she? Number three, the Dendrolites. All these tombs and underground chambers, how the hell did they see anything under there? Well, we really don't know, but we have some sort of direction. These ancient battery looking light bulbish things could have maybe been the power source. Ancient Egypt seems to be full of keyholes, drill holes, and shafts that are literally impossible without high powered tools. Most people say aliens, me included, but I also say the Dendera light bulbs. They've been theorized as being some sort of battery. The Hothor temple at Dendera contains several relief depictions, Harsimtus in the form of a snake emerging from a lotus flower. The Dendera light is a variation of this mode of showing Harsimtus in an oval container, a snake inside taking a number of humans to lift, and it holds apparent meanings of the start of creation. Look, I don't care what you say, this thing is a light bulb. It's got a filament and coils. Come on, drill holes? They couldn't have just lit fires underground, the smoke, the heat, I don't think so. Now a couple of Dewalts, just sanding up the pyramids real nice, you know? Who knows? Who knows? Number two, the city of Punt. The land of Punt or the ancient city of Punt was an ancient kingdom sometime back then. A trading partner of ancient Egypt. It was known for producing and exporting gold, aromatic resins, precious stones, black wood, ivory, you name it. The region is known from ancient Egyptian records of trade expeditions. At time, Punt is referred to as the land of God. No pressure archeologists. The exact location of Punt is debated and unknown by historians. Q Indiana Jones movie. Various locations have been offered southeast of Egypt, a Red Sea coastal region, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, no one really knows. First deciphered in Egyptian hieroglyphics in 1822, scholars began reading Egyptian texts and the mystery got mystery -er. That's not a word. More questions arose as to where Punt was located and what happened to it. The land of Punt is written by voyagers as being praised for its lavish riches and goodness of land. Okay, so it exists somewhere. This is awesome, isn't it? Wouldn't it suck if we already found everything? We're going on an expedition, boy. Grab your things, let's go. And coming into the number one spot, the Sphinx. Where do I even start? Known as the oldest carved rock like ever, its age is debated literally every day due to the questions it asks scholars. Was it wind erosion, water erosion? How many times was this thing broken and rebuilt? The Great Sphinx of Giza, the limestone statue of a reclining sphinx, a mythical creature with a head of a human and the body of a lion. Facing directly west to east, it stands on the Giza Plateau on the west bank of the Nile. The face of the sphinx appears to represent the pharaoh Khafre, although this is heavily debated as wrong gears and looking nothing like him. It's since been restored with tons of layers of limestone blocks, although still unfixed. Its nose was broken off for unknown reasons between the 3rd and 10th century. Maybe some artillery fire over the years? Who knows? The Sphinx is the oldest known sculpture in Egypt and archaeologists suggest that it was created in the Old Kingdom using unknown construction methods. Yeah, definitely that battery thing. From 1817 to 1930, this thing was buried up to its neck and written and drawn about for centuries. I wonder what other secrets lay under her right now. I guess we'll eventually find out someday. Number 10, bowling. Where would we be as a species if we didn't spend the entirety of the 1990s in bowling alleys and arcades? In later years, they seem to have fallen out of style, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Where else for $20 a person can you spend time in a large building with the heat on, and the youngest people besides you and your friends is a league of retiree bowlers saying questionable things in the lane beside you. A blue carpet with planets and rocket ships has the same amount of character as the musky clown shoes you wear as you approach the snack stand. A waff of radioactive nacho cheese assaults your nose as the bubblegum chewing student behind the counter asks if you want another room temperature domestic beer. <laughs> nice. The foam and bacteria forming in your stomach is a classic tale of a bowling alley tucked away in a Midwest snow covered state. <laughs> nice. Now with my colorful depiction aside, let's get to the history. None of that glory would be possible without the Egyptians. Yes, they invented bowling. No nacho cheese and weird animations on the TV, but it was still bowling. The ball was made of rope and leather, or sometimes rock, as were the pins. Throw it at the pins, simple, that's it, that's bowling. <laughs> Number nine, math. Oh math. You remind me of a simpler time. A time when I was bawling my eyes out while my dad asked me over and over again, what is nine times three? Expecting me to come up with the answer under the enormous weight of patriarchal pressure. 27, dad, it's 27. While the ancient Greeks usually get credit for coming up with mathematics, they actually took it from the Egyptians across the Mediterranean. And then yes, they improved upon it. The Egyptians used a numeral system that helped them solve equations involving multiplication and the absolutely disgusting fractions. 
These guys understood concepts such as geometry and algebra, and they were the first civilization to develop and solve second degree quadratic equations. I don't even know what that means. I wonder if there was ever a little ancient Egyptian boy who got yelled at at the ancient dinner table by his ancient father about finding the circumference of a circle in the middle of the night. Probably. Number 8. Papyrus I heard Egyptians like paper. Well you're going to be doing a lot of paper rolling when you're living in a van down by the river. Huh, strange. I, I think I've heard that somewhere before. Yes, the Egyptians gave the world papyrus, which eventually would become paper. Writing stuff down before this was very difficult. It was inscribed in clay or stone tablets. That's hard. How is a stenographer supposed to do their job? Or when you get mad at an office printer for not working? You can't just break the tablet. We've all been there before, and if I were to make a list of the most important inventions of all time, paper would be on that list. Number 7. Black ink. So you make papyrus paper, but what the heck are you going to use to write on it? Ink. You're going to use ink. Obviously. That's right, the ancient Egyptians actually invented ink. Now, they weren't the only ones, the Chinese also invented ink around the same time as well. But this video ain't about them. The ink used by the Egyptians was made from soot and ash from burning wood or oil mixed with water. Some of their inks even contained lead that would help ancient Egyptians bind the ink to the paper. But they didn't just use black. They had red inks made from iron based compounds as well as blue, green, white and yellow. It was a colorful place and they were likely a colorful people. Number 6. The Haircut a little off the top, Ramses. Honestly, it's time for me to get a haircut too. Is there any mommy out there willing to cut a blue eyed boy's hair? I wish. I could go for some home cooking too. Anyway, I digress. Yes, the Egyptians very well may have invented the haircut or at least regular grooming practices. Having long hair just wasn't in their culture and honestly, in the hot sun and sands of Egypt, can you blame them? I don't think so. When I was younger, I used to have my head shaved. I thought it looked good. Eh, it kinda did, but the main reason I did it was because it kept me cool, it was functional. It may surprise you that yes, we got hot summers in Canada. So I can understand why the Egyptians did that. That being said, they did manage to keep some of their facial hair because beards are like makeup for men, we just look better with them, we look, we look good. It's a good look. Number 5. The Plow Back in the day when we started to move away from the hunter gatherer lifestyle to more of a work the land and make a new farm lifestyle, Omari would go out into the field with his hoe and cultivate his land by hand. As you can imagine this takes a hell of a long time, but we're a problem solving species. That's why we got to where we are now. And to the plow and the evolution of agriculture. So basically, you take your two favorite oxen and you connect them together and you connect them to a beam of wood that shoots out behind to the plow handle and to the blade of the plow that would go into the ground and be dragged behind by the ox, breaking up the ground. All the farmer has to do is sow the seed. This simple invention changed everything and it's still used in places where machinery is just unaffordable. Number 4. The Calendar No one would blame you if in the last two years you forgot what day it was. I know after spending a lot of time inside, I forgot what day it was, but every day is a Saturday when you eat spicy chicken wings in your tidy whities Well, the Egyptians may have had one of the first calendars and a gosh darn good one too. Their calendar had 12 months and over 300 days. The trouble is after a while it kind of got a little inaccurate. They did their best to fix it. I mean clearly if you look at the calendar, I mean clearly it's the, it's the fifth of uh, well I think that looks like three men walking in sand. And next month we have a special festival happening. It looks like it'll be a sunny day on the 12th of uh, man with ball on, on his hat. Hi hieroglyphs are hard man, I don't know. Number 3. Clocks Alright, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Egyptians invented the modern clock. No. But they did have to tell time, and as any dad or survival guru will tell you, the most reliable way to tell what time of the day it is would be that massive floating ball of plasma in the sky. The sun. Assuming it isn't a super cloudy day or anything. The obelisks we see in Egypt were not just fancy deco pieces. They were actually sun clocks, used to see how the sun would cast shadows throughout different times of the day. They even used it to figure out which days were longer and shorter. There was an even more interesting clock though, a water clock. It was basically a stone vessel with a tiny little hole at the bottom which allowed water to drip at a constant rate. The water marks spaced out at different levels would tell you how many hours had passed. This one's good because it worked at night and on cloudy days as well. Number 2. Mummification Welcome back to the land of the living my friends. 
You've been gone for quite some time. <laughs> oh. Yes, the process of mummification, probably the number one thing ancient Egypt is known for, maybe besides the pyramids. While not the only civilization of the past to practice this, they kind of ran the show here. Basically, the pharaoh's corpse has to stay fresh so their soul can make it into the afterlife. The heart stays, but everything else is like a furniture after a bad divorce. It must go. The brain was stirred up like a family reunion square dance and drained like last night's punch bowl. But wait, horror fans, there's more. Lungs, liver, bladder, intestines, stomach, kidney, and basically anything you can scoop out with your favorite ice cream scoop is going. But don't toss them out though. Some of these organs were preserved in jars. Makes nice decorations beside the piles of gold found in the tombs. Yes, my liver jars. Oh, yes. Number one, cosmetic makeup. The ancient Egyptians created makeup as far back as 4000 BC. That's a long time ago. And that's how long we've been obsessed with our looks. Yikes. Their makeup actually served more of a purpose than just looking good though. The eye makeup they used specifically was believed to cure eye diseases, which wasn't true, and would protect them from the evil eye, which, I don't know, could have been true. Kind of like the ink, they would use soot, but they would combine it with a lead mineral called galena to create a black substance they called coal. That's K-H-O-L, not C-O-A-L. They had multiple colors actually. They would make green makeup by combining malachite with galena. Now, if you saw our bizarre beauty products and history video, you probably know that lead, even lead minerals like galena, aren't really great for you. But hey, anything in the name of looking good. Kicking off our list at number 10, Ancient Egyptian Eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star, they look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So in order to avoid that mess, ancient Egyptians first first had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. You're like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days? Perfect, we'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on, you know, how to look good. I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day in high school, I had to use Dippity Do Extra Hold Hair Gel. Yeah, I showed a scale on the side. I always got the five out of six hold. That was good. Six was too much. Nobody ever did the full six. That's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling spiking glue and blasting free spray by DJ Polly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Polly D was born, what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too, how do you do it? My curls? I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Cut to today, we have whatever that is. Psst, ice spray, that's awesome. DJ Polly. psst. No. Number eight, coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee on your face. Using grounded coffee powder to exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it, I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face, on my desk, and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the dead sea was one of the most popular 
popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest, after this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bathtub, I can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party early to go have a bath. Swear to God, York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold, I'm not doing this. 40 minute walk, worth it. Leave your friends for a bath, do it. Number six, wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Is this like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use. I don't know. They would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or bran or anything like that. You didn't need to put any organs in jars, just a wax cone atop of your head. Easy. Back in 2019, experts found archaeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resin. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. It's like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. Nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. Number five, fake beards. I can't grow a beard, so maybe I'll just start rocking the, the fake one, you know, like Hatshepsut. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. The pharaoh, fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was all done as an act of politics. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose the third, and he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this bearded pharaoh that we're pretty sure we figured out. Number four, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with uh, an interesting method on getting rid of those pimples, that's for sure. Remind you, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, so. Again, creative. Physicians back then discussed pimples as these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin from four to five years. And by squeezing these spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots in there. I don't know. I'd be sick. See ya, now we're single. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. Hey, if a physician ever told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses on my persons, I would faint. That's the scariest news. I've ever heard in my life. That's some bad news, man. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah. Oh, you have acne? Hmm. Are you sure you're not turning into a bird? Maybe it's that. Come back next week. Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne, hopefully. Sorry, maggots, not acne. Maggots. All to get rid of maggots. I'm gonna go throw up. Number three, prosthetics. The ancient Egyptians were a culture of firsts and some of their achievements we still have no idea how they were able to accomplish. Like the pyramids? I couldn't tell you. Could you? Didn't think so. Hit that thumbs up. We're both wrong. We're both learning. It's very likely that some of the first ever prosthetics were used in ancient Egypt. How fascinating. Imagine being the first guy to make a toe, a fake toe. A female mummy who was discovered near Luxor had her death dated somewhere between 950 and 710 BCE. And she was also found with a prosthetic toe made from wood and leather on her person. While this, of course, is a wonderful cosmetic replacement, and it's no secret that the ancient Egyptians certainly valued aesthetics, it seems as though this prosthetic toe was completely functional and was actually used to help this woman walk. The toe, after it was discovered, has significant signs of wear and tear, which then inspired experts to start a study, look a little further. And they did. So they took participants and tested their gait, both with and without the use of a replicated toe. And in ancient Egypt, the common footwear were sandals and walking in them would have been uh, next to impossible without a big toe. So it's clear that this prosthetic was very helpful and important to those similar to this Luxor mummy. Not exactly a beauty practice, but I'm sure they also felt a little more confident with that toe. This is also too impressive to exclude. Beauty list. I'm like, yeah, toes are beautiful. Why not? Throw them on. Number two, henna. I got henna done a few years ago and I totally blanked. I forgot that it lasted longer than like two days. I was like, day four, I'm like, what's going on, man? Is this permanent? While on one hand, pun intended, it is beautiful, ancient Egyptians use of henna went beyond style and beyond imaging oneself after the gods. See, henna also has cooling effects on the body and ancient Egypt was, uh, was quite hot. It was used by ancient Egyptians to color their 
their hair and fingernails in shades of red and orange. Now this shade, this exact shade, also provided comfort on hot days. Come back with some henna, kind of nice. It lasts longer than a few days though, just so you know, if you want to get henna. It's important to know, that guy did not tell me in Greece. No, he did not. And finally, number one, deodorant. When it comes to deodorant, today we listen to the Old Spice guy. He's always whistling about something new. But long before he was born, ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs for deodorant. They made perfumes and oils, this is commonly known, but they were also the first to use any type of deodorant, like underarm deodorant. It was so impressive. Ostrich eggs mixed with a little fat and tamarisk and tortoise shell and then nuts, mix them all together and bam, there you go. You're ready for date night. Just apply all of that on your body. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. See, Egyptians would also use porridge balls. How creative is that? Flavored porridge rolled up and safely tucked in in your underarm right there, right there on your little smelly chicken wing. This morning I had some deodorant just crumble apart when I was applying it. You ever have that happen? Turns to feta cheese all of a sudden, mid-application. Now my bathroom sink looks like a Greek salad. It smells great, but not practical. Might have to go back to the porridge ball method. Who knows? Maybe I have one right now. Maybe that's why I haven't moved this arm the whole time. Who knows? Yeah.